Okay, very good afternoon to respected uh, Torun sir, president over here, and uh, HOD sir, and all other dignitaries and uh, faculty members, scholars present here. And first of all, uh, very happy new year to everyone. And uh, in this new year, we have started a, the journey using an faculty development program on recent advancement of microwave and millimeter of communication. So recent advancement is uh, so much important in this field, microwave and millimeter of communication, which is because that the millimeter wave is um, quite promising area for the future wireless communication. So whether we are talking about 5G or 6G communication, and the millimeter wave and the micro frequency range is the main focusing area where we can develop the components and using wireless uh, or wire medium, uh, we can communicate from one point to another. So there are nine persons uh, from this field. Uh, we'll discuss about this uh, advancement regarding this five days faculty development program. Therefore, the participants will get enhanced uh, or will enhance their knowledge regarding this particular field. Most of the participants are obviously in this field, they are working, they are researching in this field. Okay, so due to prior schedule, uh, our respected principal sir, Professor Dr. <coughs> so Professor Dr. Subrata Mondal sir uh, are the uh, actually absent today due to his prior schedule. So he has done some uh, recording uh, for presenting in this inaugural session. So first uh, we'll start that recording and then after after that, uh, I'll ask uh, Professor Torun Kumar Jana sir to say a few words about this uh, workshops. So he, uh, he is actually the school, uh, Dean of School of uh, Engineering so, sir, uh, first I will start with the principal side talk and then you will deliver your speech. Ha, ha. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Respect to the audience and the keynotes. Is it audible to you, sir? The principal, sir. Uh, talk. Uh, is it audible to you? Speakers. Uh, it's a great pleasure to me that. Our electronics department are going to organize a faculty development program on recent advancement of microwave and MM wave communications uh, during the period 2 to 6 January 2023. Actually, faculty development program is always needed to any higher education institute for un uh, enrichment of the knowledge of the faculties because faculties should know the everything. Uh, to satisfy their students. So, which things are not coming in the textbooks that is on research, por research portions, so that should be highlighted in the faculty development program or any type of seminar workshop. So, like HIT, Old Institute of Technology, which is a very vibrant college, here always each and every department are trying to uh, keep themselves at up to date knowledge and upgraded knowledge as they can satisfy their students. So my best wishes to success of this faculty development program and uh, our faculties and other participants will reach, enrich their knowledge about these topics as they can satisfy students. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, uh, Principal Sir, uh, for his valuable talks uh, about this program and his uh, thought process. And now I request uh, Professor Torun Kumar Janna Sir, who is the Dean of the Dean School of Engineering of this institute. So sir, uh, kindly say a few words about this events. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. 
so good afternoon uh, since principal is out of station uh, professor chanchal kumar de head of the department of electronics and communication engineering who is the program chair the coordinators dr abhishek das dr abhishekankar roy and mr surajit mukherjee and other members of the ec department who are instrumental in organizing this wonderful faculty development program at the beginning of our new session and most importantly in the new year so i take this opportunity to convey my sincere good wishes to all the members participants associated with this faculty development program so that this particular new year brings lot of opportunities happiness joy and eventually all associated with this program will be able to fulfill their dreams in this particular year i congratulate the program chair professor de and other coordinators and members for selecting this very contemporary and uh, very emerging topic for faculty development program at the beginning of our new session this is the right time to organize this sort of events because we have not started our day to day academic classes yet and students are perhaps in their vacation then they have just completed their um end semester examination so they will be looking for some gap before resuming their classes as far as the topic is concerned i am not very much sound in this particular emerging area but as a common people this much i can say that this mm web communication which is a part of wireless communication is becoming extremely popular particularly as far as the mobile communication which as a, any people are using in the recent times it provides some added advantage because its frequency band is much higher as compared to the microwave as far as my knowledge is concerned it is somehow in the level of 32 300 gigahertz and it is extremely compatible for 5g communication that is the perhaps the most attractive feature as a common people data rate that can be used or that can be realized in the level of perhaps 10 gbps so since more bandwidth is available so it more data perhaps it can carry so some added advantages are increased capacity higher speed less in uh, your data latency and of course more reliable because it is rather navigate through the different obstacles so this sort of programs like faculty development programs will be useful for the faculty members researchers to carry forward their research to undertake fresh research and also it will aid for their teaching learning purposes so uh, so at the end i convey my sincere regards and thanks our department of electronics and communication engineering for hosting this one week faculty development program and a special thanks once again since they have considered iqsc as their partner because you know that iqsc at the core of our nac accreditation program so this sort of faculty development program seminar webinars and your uh, what is called signature conference which is held in the march icc this will be extremely useful for the nac accreditation purpose and of course for nba purpose also because this, all these activities will help us to fetch more credit points to uh, go for the for the accreditation purpose so i believe that this particular one week program will be extremely useful 
quite a good number of eminent speakers from the academia as well as from the industries are there so they will consider uh, they will focus their attention to the different pros and cons of this micro wave and millimeter wave and latest state of the art communication so i believe that all concerned will be extremely benefited and at the end of this particular five days program they will be enriched and they will carry forward the valuable input they will be receiving in the their forthcoming work i wish all success to the organizer to the participants and once again i would like to convey my sincere wishes good wishes for this new year 2023 thank you very much uh, thank you tarun sir uh, for your valuable words and your thoughts regarding this uh, topic uh, uh, hopefully the future talks by the eminent speakers will help us to gain knowledge regarding this uh, areas so next i'd like to request uh, our departmental head professor dr chanchal kumar de to say few words about this event sir you can unmute yourself please uh, am i audible yes sir okay. uh, good afternoon and happy new year to all of you honorable uh, principal sir professor subrata mondal dean sir school of engineering professor tarun kumar jana our most valued invited guest professors my dear friends participants ladies and gentlemen our department electronics and communication engineering go through many technical events throughout the year like international conference webinar workshop faculty development program technical quiz model competition coding competition etc in the starting of 2023 so we are organize organizing a faculty development program on recent recent advance of microwave and millimeter wave communication rammc 2023 the aim of the faculty development program is to enrich the knowledge of faculties to interaction with the eminent personality from the industries as well as academics the knowledge sharing will improve the teaching learning process to the student and will benefit the society our topic fdb topic very promising the microwave and millimeter wave communication is a promising technology in wireless communication system microwave radio transmission is commonly used in point to point communication system on the surface of the earth in satellite communication and in deep space radio communication the other part of the microwave radio band are used for radar radio navigation system sensor network system radio anatomy etc the micro and millimeter wavelength frequency band are promising spectrum for 5g and 6g mobile communication system which includes the high data rate high bandwidth high capacity and security low latency etc i hope this fdb program will help to the researchers to exchange their ideas on the recent advance of microwave and millimeter wavelength technology for the next generation 5g and 6g communication system i would like to thanks our invited speaker for spending their valuable time i would like to thanks the participant to be a part of the technical event we hope you all will enjoy this technical event and will make it successful thank you have a nice day thank you sir uh, for your valuable talks uh, regarding these events and for your best wishes so with this uh, we are concluding the inaugural session though our uh, first invited talk by professor pogran chakravarti uh, he has already joined probably he has joined the okay so now professor pogran chakravarti thank you for joining uh, with us uh, quite before time uh, you are now co-host so you can unmute yourself and you can present yourself so as our
talk will start from 3 p.m. So we take a five to seven minutes break and we'll start from exactly at 3 p.m. Professor Chakravarti, uh, can you hear us? Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes. Absolutely audible, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm. So there was so, uh, some problems with the settings. That's the reason. Okay. okay I wasn't able to do it. Good afternoon. Uh, thank Good you afternoon. for having me here. Uh, so perhaps I I need to start at three, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Because the you know inaugural session is already over. Mm. And that is what I could hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually didn't know that uh, I should uh, be participating in the inaugural session. So I thought of joining at three, but just a few moments back, Dr. Abhishek told me to join. So I did. Okay. Anyway, okay. so uh, shall I rejoin after after a few minutes? No, no you can you can just uh, mute yourself and turn off your video. Just after a few minutes, you join. Okay, okay, okay fine. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon to respected uh, Dr. Pogram Chakraborty and all other dignitaries uh, present here and also the participants. So we will start the talk of Dr. Pogram Chakraborty with a brief introduction of him. So Dr. Chakraborty received his B degree in electronics engineering from Nagpur University his MTech degree in radio frequency and microwave engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And he has received his PhD degree in his electronics and communication engineering from National Institute of Technology, Durgapur. He did a postdoctoral research in CR, CNRS lab, STICC, France, and served as a full professor in a couple of engineering colleges of India. He began his career as a lecturer in the year 2001. He is the founder and principal director of CARET. Uh, his research interests include semiconductor device modeling of RFIC applications, millimeter wave devices for beyond 5G communications, and defense equipments, antenna arrays for pattern synthesis and signal processing, phase data adders. Design of passive and active microwave circuits over different circuit board technologies, computational intelligence for optimization and acoustic arrays. He is also a senior member of IEEE, fellow of IET, and fellow of IEI, with several publications in international and journals and conferences. Some of his research article has been published in top journals like IEEE transaction in antennas and propagation, IEEE antennas and propagation, antennas and wireless propagation letters, IEEE signal processing, packaging, and so on. He served as a reviewer in many prestigious journals like IEEE antennas and wireless propagation letters, IEEE transaction or systems, man and cybernetics, systems IEEE, IET microwave and antenna propagations. IET Electronics Letters, IET Signal Processing, Journal of Acoustic Society of America, Applied Soft Computing, Elsevier, uh, to name a few. He is also the, an, an editorial board member of Azerbaijan Journal of High Performance Computing. He has some important contributions like creation of new fundamental equations for semiconductor devices, creation of digital low pattern modulation, creation of modulation scale multiple access, invention of radiation pattern corrector for mutually coupled antennas, invention of a grating globe suppressor in antenna arrays. With these brief introductions, uh, I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Pokran Chakravarti. So, sir, can we start? Thank you. Thank you for the elaborate uh, introduction. And uh, well, uh, so shall I begin? Yes, I think uh, there are 53 participants, right? Or, or yeah. maybe 50, 55 participants in total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, are they all faculty members? Or we have some students no, uh, as well. Uh, research scholars. Research scholars, mostly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are some of them faculty members? Because Faculty members, mostly faculty members, and few are okay. the research scholars. Few are the research oh. scholars. OK, uh, fine. So. Someone okay. Now uh, I'll start my uh, just a minute. Let me see. Can you see the slide? Uh, are you all able to see the slide? Yes, sir. Clearly visible. Okay. No. So uh, the uh, topic that I chose for today uh, is named as active substrate pool. Uh, none of you perhaps have heard about this because this is uh, quite an up and coming technology restricted uh, uh, to a very particular lab in France where I worked. Uh, but this has uh, a very promising future. Uh, what I could see. So I, I think that uh, this needs to be uh, well introduced in our country and I'll be uh, through different, uh, you know, such such programs. I'll, I'll talk about this in different colleges across the country. 
Now, uh, this being one of the first where I, uh, I would like to introduce this. Now, uh, let us see what exactly this is. So before we begin with active substrate board, let's see uh, what, what we have presently in microwave technologies and what improvements do we need to, uh, need to have or rather we wish to have. There might not be some improvements which we need, but there are so many things which we do not need but still wish to have, you know, like device miniaturization. Uh, so I'll be talking about it. In electronics industry, the key focus for future has you know, always been device integration and device miniaturization, so to say. So uh, we are all aware about Moore's law and how it, you know, kind of, exponentially uh, the integration takes place uh, and uh, we do not know uh, whether we'll be able, uh, able to uh, you know digress from the Moore's law ever or not uh, so that is one of the things and microwave engineering being a branch of electronics is no different right so here also the focus had been uh, the device needs to be compact smaller and smaller uh, because you know one of the reasons that uh, we find a need for it rather than just a kind of wish is that uh, is that it smaller the devices are lesser the power they consume that's one of the uh, vitalities of device miniaturization but at times it becomes inconvenient because you know uh, the true device miniaturization or what we can say a true system miniaturization is not possible because they need to interact with the peripheral devices. So the best thing that we have uh, with microwave technologies is the MMIC technology. Here you see a photogram. This has been taken from uh, the internet. Uh, these are referenced. I'll, I'll show this where the pictures are taken from, but this is of not of much use. As you can see, this is a fully integrated 3.5 gigahertz single chip gallium nitride power amplifier so here you see uh, even a power amplifier is a kind of system that we talk about but if we talk about a complete transmission and reception system that that cannot be accumulated or or, or integrated within uh, the mmic technology as you can see some of the distributed circuits of this on chip Inductors can be seen, some transmission lines can also be seen. And the, this entire power amplifier has been made using MMIC technology. This is what we have in latest with us. Okay, now, why is a PCB still required for a complete microwave system to operate? And this is what I was talking about. Hopefully everyone can hear me. It is it's so silent. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, and and anybody who wants to, you know, uh, put up a question can always do, and the moderator will take it up with me. Okay. Uh, at any moment of time, they can raise the question, write it down in the text box, and then send it like a message. So perhaps that will be the most convenient way to interact. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, so you see, uh, the PCB is in any way required. Uh, why? Why is that so? Say so one of the obvious answers is that for any electronic or microwave system to function, connection to peripheral devices, uh, the peripheral de devices cannot be miniaturized because that being uh, uh, non-miniaturizable in a way is a must. You see. Because, for example, you want to uh, connect, say, a uh, USB connector. Uh, you cannot have a USB connector of a micron size. You cannot have a, a MOSFET channel equivalent a USB connector. You cannot handle that. You can't even see that without a microscope, can you? So the point is that the, where we interact with peripherals, and when we say peripherals, that means these peripherals are made to interact with humans. So we need to see our convenience as well. We, uh, even if we develop a technology where a entire system can be put in a, a chip, entire maybe a computer can be put inside the chip, 
but it won't be of any use for humans just because we won't be able to interact with it. Because for even to interact, we need such connections which humans can see and handle. So, so there is a device miniaturization restriction because in any case, we need to have a PCB where all these microchips are connected. They are then connected to the peripherals. And these peripherals are finally given interface to the humans for us to interact, whether it's a keyboard or whether it's the USB drive or, or maybe the CD drive. So here you see that there's a picture of the CD drive being shown here, PCB of a DVD player, right? So, so this is one of the things that uh, that you know mandates us to have PCB in any case. Okay, let's go ahead. What happened? Oh, this seems to have frozen. Okay. Now, why? Uh, now there's another reason. Let us see what is that. The semiconductor chips aren't good enough for high Q. So even if we have uh, you know, the miniaturization done on MMIC, there are certain things we need to have more. Like example, we want to have a high Q inductor or a high Q capacitor. Uh, as you can see in this picture, you need to have this ferrite uh, coil, uh, you know, an inductor and capacitors, big sized capacitors to have larger values of capacitance, larger values of inductance. Uh, and you need high Q for that, right? So, but despite having, you know, even, even the uh, board, the MIC, MMIC board that can have a dielectric, maybe a dielectric constant equivalent to 11.7 or something like, something around 12, it's, uh, it's possible, okay? Despite that, you know, uh, you cannot have a high Q uh, inductor or a capacitor there because uh, the on-chip ones, as you can see here in the MMIC technology, this on-chip one, these are very small. You cannot make them large because the chip itself is small. You cannot make it larger. You cannot make the on-chip inductor uh, larger than the chip itself. <laughs> and when you require that, how do you do that? You have to put it off-chip, right? So the thing is that uh, for the high Q uh, uh, inductors or capacitors devices that we require at times and most of the times with RF operations, microwave operations, uh, so uh, those cannot be put inside the MMIC all the time for a wider bandwidth operation, say, or or at times we need uh, greater insertion in the higher, uh, lesser insertion loss. Okay, so uh, there are so many requirements that uh, I think many of you are aware of. So such high Q devices cannot be integrated inside MMIC. So this is another point that we have to see. Now, semiconductor uh, chips can't provide very wide bandwidth. That's another problem. That's another problem. Uh, now, why that's so? Because again, you know, it, although it's although you have uh, high Q, and you you know that high Q devices, uh, if you relate them to their fractional bandwidths, so it is always the central frequency divided by the del W the I say omega naught divided by del w is equal to the quality factor okay so higher is the quality factor the lesser is the fractional bandwidth and uh, inherently the quality factor that you uh, have with the mmics are higher and due to that high q uh, i mean see see the, uh, the irony here at one place you need uh, uh, such a higher iq uh, higher uh, quality factor that you cannot integrate the inductors and capacitors uh, inside it but with a very high q again inside uh, i mean the standard q that you have inside an mmic that prohibits a very wide bandwidth that's another problem you see so in that case you need a larger again a larger structure a larger structure would allow you to have a wider bandwidth with higher q despite having higher Q. So another thing is larger structure, just like the inductors that we talked about. So larger structures cannot be 
ac uh, accommodated inside the uh, the uh, chip that's the problem and we need such larger structures for the uh, for some designs to take place may, uh, may not be all now another thing is semiconductor chips are lossy for displacement currents this is this is another fundamental limitation now when we say displacement currents we are talking about waves so the waves when they go or move inside the inside the board say the your printed circuit board uh, they are able to move inside the printed circuit board just because they are moving through a perfect dielectric and what happens is as in as and when you know, this this direct dielectric gets replaced by conductive properties so semiconductors have conductive properties right they're not perfect dielectrics so uh, the ones you have conductive properties inside the substrate it it generates current uh, you call them eddy currents uh, most of the times so these eddy currents then create a loss factor which you see as alpha in your electromagnetic wave equation okay so you see that the it is it becomes lossy because as you can see the uh, envelope of the uh, uh, say a, a kind of wave that is traveling inside the substrate will get attenuated because of that alpha factor being generated by the conductive properties of the semiconductor which you otherwise do not have in dielectrics so this is another limitation you see that uh, complete semiconductor devices become uh, a problem for for the microwaves they can become lost and uh, then finally we have semiconductor chips are not good for low rf operations because of their large resonant lengths okay now you see uh, uh, what happens is that you all know that lesser is the frequency, larger is the resonant length required. So for low frequency operations, such larger lengths can be accommodated in PCBs, while they cannot be uh, accommodated inside, inside a chip. One, because uh, the, the high a dielectric constant of the uh, IC and the second is that uh, even with the high dielectric constant larger lengths like lambda by 2 or lambda by 4 or maybe lambda lengths are difficult and if you want to put transmission line segments uh, for uh, series transmission line segments for resonate uh, to resonate and for uh, for you know uh, for addressing the resonance issues so then also you require you know longer lengths so that becomes a problem for low rf operations so here you can see that this is a bluetooth device uh where uh, this antenna has been put outside and here you have interdigital filters these are also put outside the chips now these cannot be accommodated certainly so you and this is of course a pcb that we are looking at so so see there are so many things uh, apart from the integration of peripheral device that are particularly uh, important uh, to be addressed and to address those issues uh, we cannot put all those things you know the, the answers to those issues are not uh, any MI, MMIC or, or any integrated circuits. We anyhow require something like a board. Okay. So any questions so far? Any questions from the moderator? Any questions uh, which have been dropped out? I would like to answer those. Let me see if uh, anybody has a question. Uh, no, sir. I'm not right at the moment. So you can continue. So, okay. so are, are, are you able to clearly understand this? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, so let us go ahead. An active substrate boards. Now here we come to active substrate boards. So active substrate boards are a new trade-off between semiconductor chips and PCBs. 
Okay. So what is this trade-off? Let's let's see. Advantages of circuits on ASB, ASB B, active substrate port. Easy fabrication of tunable devices. So you see that uh, for active substrate boards, we can at, at the moment we'll see the structure of that and all that. But uh, at the moment we can see that this is a kind of a trade-off between, as I wrote there, it's a trade-off between a very small uh, chip and a large PCB. So for for uh, chip, the size of the chip, the PCB is always large, right? So between a PCB and a chip, we have a trade-off, and that is the active substrate board that I'm talking about. So it is not as large as a PCB and not as small as the chip, microchip, okay? So what it can do is it can actually uh, integrate a lot of integrated circuits inside with different uh, denominations of different areas. It can have digital, it can have analog into that board that we have, that active substrate board, and still small in size, you know? And, and the bigger size of it, since it is big, big in size, it can also accommodate such RF circuits, which would otherwise uh, have not been integrated inside an uh, IC or an MMIC, so to say. Okay, so uh, this is a kind of in-between solutions that we are talking about. Okay, and also we have to see that more than 5x, uh, so these a a ASBs are more than 5x smaller than the traditional PCBs. It can be five times smaller than the traditional PCBs. And, and that that's the minimum, you know, you can have it 10 times smaller as well. Okay, so uh, what I mean here is that we need to conveniently scale down these. So they should not be, uh, so much scale down that we uh, find it hard to interact and we find it hard to integrate the uh, different other circuits like wideband filters, antennas, and all those things inside. So here you can see uh, the quality factor and size have been, uh, this, this uh, the technologies have been put against the quality factor and size. You can see that when the quality factor is high, you have active components, okay? And uh, a very small active component is not desirable. Those which are not desirable have been put in red, okay? And those which are desirable have been uh, put in green. So what you uh, have here is that if you have a larger, uh, even if the quality factor is high, if you have a larger size circuit, okay? Uh, then it can accommodate all the microwave elements which we require. So it is good. And this is our proposed, uh, you know, the proposed area that we are talking about, proposed integrated tunable devices. Now, why tunable? This is another important thing. You know, when we have a PCB, a PCB doesn't give an in inherent uh, structure of tunability. But uh, the active substrate board actually gives an inherent structure of tunability that is very important for us to know now see here uh, like the tunable devices which we have normally in pcbs here it is put in red okay so the pcbs are very very large the large very large are also not desirable at this moment because we want to miniaturize it for, for the standard focus that we have uh, for, for our future technologies. We cannot miniature, we cannot have very large structure. And these very large structures uh, also are not good enough uh, for, and, and, and the second thing is, if you have very small structure, that's also not advisable, you know, just because uh, you cannot integrate the RF uh, components there. So here you have a compromise where you can integrate uh, uh, the non-RF structures in that very, very small sizes and the RF structure in the bigger sizes. So these are the areas, you know, which we can actually uh, talk about. And this is a trade-off between these two. Hopefully this diagram is clear. If any, anybody 
wants to ask some uh, something about this diagram and the interpretation of it. If anybody is confused about it, can ask. Moderator, do you have any question on this? Uh, is it a need to design it, the active substrate board? Yes, of course. It's uh, design in the sense. Design means. Uh, see, like everything requires. Uh, see, everything requires design, and everything requires fabrication. Okay. Everything requires fabrication and design. So before designing, you cannot do fabrication. If you do not do fabrication, you cannot have anything material in your hand, right? So it is uh, the requirements are similar to the other things. We have to design it. I think what the, the, what the kind of question that you are asking is that, uh, that is the substrate. What type of substrate we generally use for the design of micro strip patch antenna? So right. uh, for the design of ASB, this mm. type of uh, material is required, or uh, which type of design is required for yes, the yes, I'll, ASB. I'll, I'll reveal that. I'll reveal that. So uh, now the thing is, do you uh, find this uh, diagram difficult to interpret? I'll come to that. Uh, but right at this moment for this diagram, uh, are you able to interpret this correctly? Yes, sir. Any problem with this? No, sir. Okay. And anybody else, if you, you can ask the question to some, uh, any if anybody has any doubt, can communicate so far with whatever I've asked, uh, whatever I've uh, told so far. Okay. So let us go ahead. Now let's see what active substrate board is. Now have a good look at this. This is what it is. Okay. Now what you see here, uh, you are just the moderator was just talking about that for you know you need a PCB. Okay. Uh, so here also we have something like a PCB, but it isn't a PCB. What is it? It is a bigger size semiconductor board. It looks like the normal PCB and the normal microstrip here. Can you see this microstrip transmission line? It's a microstrip transmission line. But what is the board here? It is high resistivity silicon. And it's a P type high resistivity silicon. And you have a ground plane here, which is a metallic ground plane. You can also have it with polysilicon, okay? And you can ha also have this as polysilicon instead of uh, the metallic line. So I made it metallic so as uh, to make, make others comfortable with the technology. Just like the normal CMOS technology, this can, uh, the metals can be replaced by polysilicon, which we call as poly, okay? So uh, we should remind ourselves this, this entire thing is fabricated using CMOS technology. It's not a PCB, okay? It is using the standard CMOS technology. This entire thing can be made out like that. So this is a high resistivity silicon. And since it is high resistivity silicon and its uh, dielectric constant is near, uh, near say 12, it's 11.7, okay? And here, you have, uh, and here you can see the cross section as well. Now here, you can see that under this transmission line, you have an N doped area, N plus doped area. What this means is that this P is not P, P plus, this P is simply P, and P plus would mean that you have higher number of uh, uh, the carrier concentration uh, with P plus. Similarly, uh, N plus is higher uh, uh, higher number of carrier concentration than the usual N that we uh, mean here. Okay, so what you can see here is that this is also a diode. A diode. How? Because you have see an N N type material here a p type material here okay and due to this n and p type material this becomes a diode got it and if we connect a source here as shown here 
this becomes, and, and with the polarity shown here, this becomes a forward bias diode. So it is not just a transmission line. It is a transmission line over a semiconductor board, CMOS semiconductor board, but it is also a diode, OK, at this moment of time. So with this technology, you can inherently make diodes, which make, makes it inherently a tunable device, OK? Now, if you are uh, confused about how that this becomes tunable device, I'll talk about it. Now, you see this under this particular uh, transmission line, you can have various lengths of doping. You did not have doping for the entire length of the transmission line. Are you getting it? So if you want it, you can have it uh, under a small portion of it, a small portion here and a small portion there. Are you getting the point? So the thing is that here you also have a distributed diode under the active substrate board. And how is it beneficial? We have to look at that. What benefits can we draw from this kind of a structure? OK, uh, any questions here as to the understanding of this? Hopefully, this is uh, understood by all. It's just the normal microstrip. You have the cross section shown here. You also have the top view. And you know, under this microstrip, you can have different lengths of the N type, N plus type, type doping. Okay. So the diodes can be uh, bigger. We're taking a larger areas at times and smaller areas at times according to your requirements hopefully this is clear to all of you any question no sir you can go ahead okay Please. now let us see what what advantages does it give implementation of a parallel rf switch no we have we all know about the switching action you cannot have tunable devices without switches hopefully this is known to everybody so even if if you have say a kind of filter you want to switch it if you, you want to have an antenna with different bandwidths you need to switch it so you need to have reconfigurability we switching can also mean reconfigurable uh, reconfigurability now there is a difference between general reconfigurability and switching and now switching can usually bring uh, discrete uh, reconfigurability, whereas uh, reconfigurability uh, means both, where you have where you can have discrete one, discrete reconfigurability, as well as a continuous reconfigurability. So here, what we are looking at is at a switch. Say, for example, a parallel switch. In a normal PCB, what happens is if you want to make a parallel switch uh across a transmission line what you need to do is you will have to connect a diode okay and then drill a wire hole and that wire hole then is connected to the ground plane so this is you this is how you have a parallel diode that means a diode which you actually wanted to function between the top uh, transmission line and the ground plane you want the diode to function between these two the transmission line at the top and the ground plane at the bottom, you want to function the diode uh, between these two. Unfortunately, in normal PCB technologies, if you want to insert a diode between the substrate, the PCB will break, right? So here, with this the CMOS technology, what we are doing is, what we are achieving is, that we need not connect a diode across here. Here, since we already have uh, a doped area, under this transmission line, this acts as a, as a diode, the one which is being shown here. So the, the diode which this becomes, this diode becomes a parallel switch. Now, how is it a switch? That should also be known. As you can see, there is a microwave flow through this transmission line. If you put this diode on, what will happen? The current starts flowing through here. Now, since this 
current flow uh, starts flowing through here, what will happen? The thing which is otherwise dielectric, because of its high resistivity, it is dielectric. The moment the diode operates, current starts flowing under this transmission line. And when current, current starts flowing, what will happen? This starts behaving like a conductor. It will reflect back the microwaves that is coming, that are coming. OK? So when the diode is switched on, the microwave, which, which is flowing through the transmission line, will be switched off. OK? So this is how it acts as a switch. Inherently, it can be, it can be uh, functioned like a switch. The, the ASB, so to say. OK? So this is one of the primary aspects of, a, uh, of an ASB, where you can implement a switch very, very easily. Now you can see the performance of this switch. This has been taken from reference 8. I'll show what it is. Okay. Now you see, when the switch is uh, turned on. Now, when I say switched is turned on, that means the diode is off, OK? Or it is reverse bias, whatever it is. So diode is off. Because the diode is off, the microwaves can pass. So that means the microwave, the switch is off. Uh, oh, sorry, the switch is on. OK, uh, I'm sorry. The switch is on, and the microwaves can pass. But the diode is off. So when the diode is off, the switch is on, the microwaves wave can pass. Similarly, when the diode is on, the switching action is off, uh, the switching action is on, and the microwaves cannot pass. So when the switching action is off, when the microwaves are not able to pass, you have this, this one, this blue one, OK, isolation. It's written as isolation. That means when the uh, switch is off. OK. So here you can see it's more than minus 20 dB of isolation, which we can achieve. And when it is switched on, that means when the diode is off, you can almost have the 0 dB. So these are measured and simulated results being shown here. OK. And this is uh, return loss. <clears throat> this is insertion loss. OK, as you can see this, so S11, that's the return loss, insertion loss, S21, OK? So S21 is here in red. Insertion isolation is plotted in blue, OK? And return uh, loss is plotted in black. The dotted ones are simulated ones. The continuous ones are, the continuous ones are, the measured ones, right? Now just observe this one, this particular figure. What anomaly do you see here? Can you see any kind of an anomaly? Anybody? Just a question. Hello, moderator. Uh, sir, isolation and uh, insertion loss, hmm. and, and also the return loss. Actually, isolation and return loss hmm. are almost uh, same hmm. in the case of measured or uh, simulated. So that is uh, no, 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 no. That's not the thing. That can be same. That's a different case. You see. Okay. But the problem here, can you can you see that in other cases, if you see the return loss or insertion loss, mm -hmm. S21 or S11, mm -hmm. the simulated results do not differ from the measured results much. Mm -hmm. Whereas in isolation, the simulated results differ a lot from the yes. measured yes. results. Can you see this? Yes, 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 yes. A lot of difference. Uh -huh, yes. A lot of difference. Why is this so? Okay. okay. 
hope I, I I can all I can get across all of you and hope you are finally finding this interesting. And if not, please ask questions, because you see, uh, if you are not finding it interesting, there's no point in speaking about it. No, sir. You you continue. Uh, you, you tell me if you have any questions, because you see, only two two kind of people. Neither of these, right? So we must have some questions. Uh, usually, I need to. Uh, I I like to interact with people, you know. Where the uh, this it, it should not be one way broadcast mode. We are communication engineers, hmm. and we have we must have full duplex communication, two way right. communication, right? Yes, right. So so uh, so the thing is, uh, at any moment of time, that's the reason I'm time and again I'm telling. You, that okay. please interact. Okay. If you find uh, uh, find it difficult for uh, to understand what it is, uh, then please let me know. Or if you want to say something about it, it need okay. not be uh, a question, you know, uh, which a doubt that that is to be solved. It can be anything that you, you can just interact because this is a faculty development program, and you have a you have PhD students as well. Okay, so they can interact, you know, uh, add something to it. Say something about it. What exactly it is? Okay. So we must be in a habit of interaction. Right. When, whenever, whenever you you call somebody up, it's important that the person who is speaking uh, would like to gauge what what is happening. I mean, uh, whether people are able to hear it, uh, understand it, or not. Usually, in a classroom uh, environment, uh, you can have a look at people's faces, <laughs> right? But here, you uh, what I can see is a slide. And I'm just speaking. Yes, right. And and nobody uh, and I uh, with a pin drop silence, uh, ah. I'm speaking it. So at times it, it sounds that uh, maybe uh, whether it, this has been disconnected or not, no, 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 or, no. or or at times you know it's it's yeah, it, important that we interact. Yeah, okay. It's it happened. So we have taken the classes during the uh, pandemic period. So at that time also we are feeling as a teacher we are also feeling like that. Right. That, right. Uh, as you so, as you are feeling right now. <laughs> uh, yes, this yeah. this happens. Yeah. Uh, but but it is important. So but it is always important to interact. Right. 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 So usually I can uh, in a classroom I can say, hey, did you understand this? What mm -hmm. what do you mean by this? Mm -hmm. So I can actually uh, jump upon somebody mm -hmm. and ask something. Now, here I can't see anybody. You see, yeah, yeah. so that's 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 a problem, yeah. and uh, and this this makes the entire talk less lesser interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, just you just let me know mm -hmm. whether you have heard about the, uh, the the kind of things that I'm talking about. Whether you have heard about this or not? No, sir. Active substrate board. We have not heard about that thing. This is new. This is new to us. Okay. Now, yeah. when you have not heard about it, whatever I explained. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you grasp it? Because it it's not a rocket science that I'm talking about. It's something simple, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. The, the basic fabrication method you are telling about that. Uh, ah, so, so here, here your fabrication is clear, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's clear. Right. So uh, hopefully this is understood. Mm -hmm. And and I would also like that you take up questions from the rest of the participants. Mm -hmm. uh, no. If the scholars, PhD scholars, have some questions, if not yes, the faculty sir. members. We have already shared that point to everyone. Okay. Uh, hopefully, then, uh, within few slides, uh, you will. They will. Okay. The okay. Okay. Fine. So here you can see that there's a lot of difference between uh, the isolated uh, isolation and and the the simulated and measured results of the isolation. Okay. So we will uh, talk about this issue later. You just have this in mind, okay? And I'll talk about why is this happening. Okay. Now let us see. Now we have a bandwidth tunable microwave filter on active substrate board. Okay. Hope this is understood. What is yeah. it? Bandwidth tunable microwave filter. So you see that here you have a transmission line and here you have these tubs. Now mm -hmm. these tubs are 
connected, uh, some of these tabs have actually dope dopings, or rather, all of them. These are doped areas, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with different switching combinations of these doped areas, we can actually have these two different bandpass responses. One is shown in pink, another is shown in blue. The S two one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the S11 ones of those are shown here. So you see, when these uh, this is the diode is switched on, okay, mm -hmm. uh, it is made one minus one point six five volts shown here. Okay, mm -hmm. so when it is switched on, here you get uh, the pink response, S21 response, and the green dotted response, the fluorescent green dotted response for mm -hmm. S11. And when the diode is not operating, okay, when you have zero volts across it, like here, here we have zero volts, okay, zero mm -hmm. volts across. So if we have zero volts across here, mm -hmm. then the diode is not operating. And if we put it 1.6 volts, or there it is conventionally written minus 1.6 volts, mm -hmm. just because you know it's the reverse side, you know. Uh, so it's conventionally written so. Otherwise, the diode is actually on. It's not reverse biased. Okay. So diode, when the diode is on, uh, the uh, then you have this kind of a response. Here you see the diode is not working as a switch. It is working as a tunable device. Uh, a, a, a tunable, uh, what should I say? A, a tunable technique. So you switch on and switch off the diode to, to tune into different uh, different bandwidths of operation. Here, you are not actually looking at isolation. So you do not have an isolation plot here. Because here, you are not trying to stop the microwaves from flowing. You are actually adjusting the stub lengths. If, this is, if you put this diode on, the stub length is actually this here to here. But when you put this on, the stub lengths become shorter. Now, when you have this, that means you actually, instead of a wire hole, you have actually put uh, through a current here. So this acts as a wire hole, you know? So uh, a short circuit, a short circuit being imposed here. Are you getting the point? So yeah. if, if a current flows through here, it, it is just like a short circuit uh, enforced through a wire hole, right? Mm -hmm. So the point here is that if this doped area starts working as a diode then th there's a current all across this place mm -hmm. and this this actually the length of this tab is shortened short circuit right? a short circuit so a short circuit put here here mm -hmm. okay earlier it this is, is an open, open circuit one it's an open circuit and the length is this much the total mm -hmm. length is from here to here the total length okay but when this is put on the total length becomes shorter are you getting the point or not yes sir so when these diodes are uh, put on together switched on together so this is <laughs> the response that you are getting which one the uh, the pink one okay when the diodes are on uh, on that is pink one the s21 response that means the insertion loss so this is these are the waves which are passing through from this end to this yes. end so here this is the input from this end okay output this end and these are the stubs any confusion here no sir no sir it is clear and and there's there's a difference as well mm -hmm. uh, you have here apart from the uh, near the ground plane you also have a p plus doped area mm -hmm. This uh, increases the diode's efficiency. In the other diagram, which I what I showed, did not have that. You see, there is no p-type doping here. Okay. So here, this has an additional p-type layer just near the ground plane. Okay. This enhances the performance. It it uh, actually reduces the capacitance that is formed between a metal semiconductor junction okay so these are a few uh, nitty gritties that that are known to uh, the cmos design engineers okay uh, 
usually the microwave design engineers do not know about this. Uh, but then it's not a very big problem. You know, once you start working with these, uh, you can uh, have these known to you. OK, so is there any question in this slide? Anybody regarding anything? Yeah, Shuma Kondo, madam, uh, you can uh, write. Uh, or, uh, you can okay. write down, or you can also speak because okay. there are no. The, if we had a lot of speakers, uh, you know, uh, trying to speak together, that becomes difficult. Otherwise, okay, yes. okay, I am unmuting. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, Juma ma'am, you can ask a question, you can unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, sir, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, my are. question is that, sir, can, uh, can we use this ASP for making bandpass filter instead of HIW? Well, this is a bandpass filter. Yes. So what you are looking at is yes, these yes. are switchable, tunable bandpass filter, yes. a bandwidth tunable microwave filter. And this is a bandpass filter that you're looking at, not just one bandpass filter. With the same structure, you are getting two bandpass filters with two different bandwidths, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So and sir. you can switch on and switch these off. Yes, yes. Sir. Now your question, sir, yes. Sir, uh, we, uh, I generally use SIW. Okay. Okay, sir, sir, my question is that instead of HIW, can you use this ASP? Yes, because... of course. That's the purpose of this, you see. You can see the uh, you can see the frequency ranges. This is from 2 to 10 gigahertz, so 0 to 10 gigahertz operation range. Okay. Yes. Being yes. shown here. So it's same as the operation range of uh, anything made on PCB technologies. It, it is just like the substrate integrated waveguide, you know, the operating yes. range. So and and the power handling capacity is also same. It could be lesser. It can be more. No problem. As much as the no usual uh, the uh, microwave devices. So okay. that is the reason we are trying to bring this in. You know, okay, because so. uh, because it is just it is not just an SIW. It yes. is also an integrated circuit. So a corner here, you can see uh, maybe this is a filter that you have, but in uh, in a small corner of this particular. <clears throat> PCB, we can we can uh, you know scoop off uh, a portion of silicon, put an N well or P well, and make a CMOS circuit right here, right here. Okay. We can use you can make a digital circuit right here, okay, okay. right here, and okay. this becomes an entire system which accommodates integrated circuit as as well as a board and everything together. This acts like the usual PCB where you can implement microstrip, you can implement SIW, you can implement co-planner waveguide and so on and so forth. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes. That, that uh, we have the problem whenever we are going to uh, design these things because simple mm. PCB fabrication technology is easier to realize. Right. right. But uh, that CMOS technology is not easier to realize for the common researcher. So we need the high-end technological research lab. Uh, oh. How are we well, this? Well, the problem is that it is a kind of a taboo that we have made. You know, this is not possible. The thing is that all the almost all the primary IITs mm -hmm. have such uh, fabrication uh, technologies available where we can make these easily. Yes. Mind you, we do not require the latest uh fabrication technologies here we we are not making a three nanometer device you know no no so the our our uh, say transistors and uh say the diodes and all those things made here in this chip can have a lot older technology maybe not even in nanometers we can talk about micrometers it can be 120 micrometer technology the older one you know so the problem here is that we are talk we are not talking about uh, micrometers and uh, nanometers of length 
so we can have a very crude technology which is which are available across uh, uh, many prominent uh, places yeah. in our country and uh, some or the other day we ne need to take advantages of these fabrication facilities i had been talking to one of the persons in iisc mm -hmm. bangalore they have such a first class facility but it's only the iisc bangalore students who mm -hmm. use it they have opened it for the entire country you see but nobody approaches them nobody uses it so if you approach an iit they are not going to say no to you because this is this is uh, something that they want they want to collaborate they want to get in touch with others they'll be happy to help you okay they might charge a fees because uh, mm -hmm. this entire thing but those will be very nominal the charges which are uh, taken by iits or educational institutes like iisc iit those are very very uh, uh, less you know the charges that they take they will also measure it for you but before all this you need to have a proper uh, design and mm -hmm. then gds2 file you should generate and give give it to them okay okay okay, okay, okay. so what is gds2 a gds2 people usually call it it's a misnomer it is gdsii okay it is it is gerber data uh what is that uh, i'm forgetting data exchange i think G data switch okay, okay. interchange interface okay okay I gds gds ii so uh, of course we call it gds ii and uh, the entire full form sometimes you know it gets off the mind so it, it's it's uh, it's gerber data uh it starts with that and ii is interchange uh interface and s is uh i do not know what i just it's dropping out of mind any anyway, anyway so that is it so you uh, when you give it to a fab lab you need to generate that file. Once that is generated, it will go to the CMOS process and gets fabricated. Okay. Yeah. And this is not a very complicated thing. ISRO also has a facility for this. Okay. Okay. And a okay. small case, fabrication and verification is not a problem. Once you do that verification for your, let's say, a filter or an antenna that you're making, once it is done, it can be uh, accommodated uh, with, with a larger project. And that can that can be sent to say TSMC, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. You can get your uh, things uh, done there because that is that is a customized fab lab we have, uh, a very very powerful one. It takes uh, uh, orders from all across the world. Okay. 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 So any any other question? No. Uh, another question sir, from Anupam Chaurasia. Actually, uh, she is asking your publication links uh, for the, as a reference uh, so that oh, i'll i'll show can... that uh, in, the, in the last slide yeah, okay. yeah, yeah in the yeah. last two last couple of slides has all those references you'll have have a complete uh, understanding of this and also the references no problem with that i'll i'll, I'll give it okay oh, okay go ahead okay okay now now the challenge you see Apart from the challenge that you talked about, I don't see that as a challenge. But this uh, is a challenge. What happened is that I also did not know about it till I went to France and worked with one of the largest uh, scientific laboratories of the world. That's CNRS. Uh, whether you have heard about it or not, it's uh, not just one of the largest. It is the largest scientific body of uh, the world, which has labs, which has for funding just like DST. And it is something like our DST and CSI are combined, you know. So uh, I worked in one of those labs in France. And there, when I reached, I was told something which uh, took me aback. Now, what was that? When I went there, they said that, well, we are working on something like this. Uh, and uh, we want you to develop models, microwave models for different amplifiers and, uh, you know, uh, diodes and uh, all, all transistors. Using those, you can make amplifiers or uh, tunable antennas and all those things. Uh, you, uh, we want you to model all these things. I, I thought it's very interesting, definitely. I'll try doing that. So I, when I went there and sat before them for the first meeting, what they told 
was something completely unexpected for me. Okay, now what is that? They said, well, we will do all that, do all that modeling and everything. But for the past five years, we have been struggling with the DC model of this. I said, DC model of what? He said that the DC model of the diode, the inherent diode that I talked about, that DC model of that diode, they are unable to model it. They are unable to uh, understand why these diodes have such kind of a response in DC mode. No microwaves required. So you see, I said, see, you told me that this is all about microwaves. So I never worked on DC. Then say, yes, but uh, you have a wide experience. And you said you wish to take challenges. You love challenges. So I thought uh, you will be able to do this. OK? But fortunately, what happened is what they could not do for five years, I did it in three days. OK? Now let us see what the problem is. The problem here is that when these transmission lines have different dopings under them, like this is L1, L2, L3, L4, the responses of the diode, just VI response, VI characteristics, these change like this, you see? Here, if you have, uh, this is L1, that means the smallest one has this, this response, the black dotted line, okay? And L2 has this response. And in L3 and L4, the response have almost merged. So why did they merge? What is the mathematical equation behind it? So those things were completely problematic. Nobody had a clue of it. They had been trying this for uh, five years. OK, now, now for me, uh, I did it in three days. I don't know how, but I did it. Anyway, so the problem that they were facing, which I also faced, is that they wanted me to simulate this over a device physics simulator. Do you know what device physics simulators are? Have you heard about it? Anybody? Hello? No, sir. Uh, we don't have double. Nobody is anybody else? Device physics simulators? So what they actually do is they get deep into the quantum levels and the equations involved in it. They solve, this is called computational electronics, okay? So how the electrons will behave in the substrate, how the holes would behave, how the other ions would behave, how they would interact with each other to finally make a current from a voltage. So this is kind of a device physics simulator that we are talking about. So when you make a diode or you make a transistor, any kind of transistor, whether it's CMOS transistors or a BJT, whatever you wish to make, you can actually have a simulation of it, just like your uh, transmission line simulation that we can see through our RF simulators like uh, HFSs or, or CST microwave studios. Okay. So we can also have this device simulation. And these device simulations, simulators are very high-end simulators. They get inside the device physics of a particular active device, and they finally give you uh, the voltage and current relationship, uh, whether it's AC or DC, they can do both. Mm, but yes, ACs uh, become, can take more time you know, and, and more number of steps and understanding for the AC simulation. DC uh, certainly is the simplest thing that we do. OK. So, uh, the state of the art uh, here in uh, such simulation is uh, called, uh, the company is called Silvaco, OK? And this the diagram that you can see here, this is a 2D simulation of an Atlas simulator uh, available in Silvaco. Have you heard about Silvaco? I think you people might have heard about it. Silvaco? Moderator? Yes, sir. Hello. They have heard about it. Yes. Silvaco. And within Silvaco, I used I used Atlas 
to get this device physics simulate. Okay, but the point is, even to have this, it was a problem. What was the problem actually? The problem is when we use these device physics simulators, they are meant for uh, micrometer simulations. They are meant for micrometer simulations. If we have, even if we have a millimeter size simulation, those simulators are going to take hours, okay, to simulate. Now we have something like, you know, centimeter. Now, even after running these for seven or eight days, they do not get result for a simple diode that I want to make. Okay. Are you getting the point or not? So what I did was that I simulated a cross section of this diode, just a cross section. Now, this cross section shows this kind of a result. Now, you see the actual plotted results do not even match with the structure of it. So I did not do it for all. I just showed just for one. You can see that how this kind of a structure, it is structurally different. You know, the current simulation is structurally different. And moreover, uh, the basic equation for a diode characteristics is the Shockley equation. Now, I tried with the Shockley equation as well. The problem is the Shockley equation also cannot give the right answer. I mean, the Shockley equation cannot match with this. So I started from scratch and I developed a model which is available in the reference number seven. It's, it's a tech archive paper. Uh, it's still in consideration. In a journal, they find it quite difficult to understand, but I think it is understandable. Okay, so you can see how it has worked. Now the question is, uh, I want you to recall that question, which I asked. I showed you this diagram, right? Now you see there's a difference in this. Now, the, if we go down and down to the bottom of this problem, the bottom of this problem is this. Since we do not have any simulation, there is no capability of any simulator to handle this kind of a diode. Okay, Leave apart whether those simulators are doing something right or wrong. That's another question. So the Shockley equation, they simulate the Shockley equation, right? For making it into a differential equation. They uh, simulate it uh, through that. And finally, whatever they get, say, even after running, say, for seven hours, if I get something like this, which is quite different from this, then certainly there's no use of any simulator or any equation that is already in existence, right? So I have to have something different. I need to develop a completely new theory for this to be understood well, right? Now, what happens is, now when you see the, uh, the kind of isolation that we are talking about, the simulation is different and the result is different, the measured result is different. Why? Because the simulation result there the simulator actually assumes a perfect conductor when in switched off condition but it is not a perfect conductor if you uh, say switch on the diode if you increase the voltage the current is going to increase higher is the current higher it is towards the perfect conductor but lower is the current lower is the isolation now how much current will generate how much conduction that that is something we can get only from these curves and not from any other simulate, simulation. And even if we do a device physics simulation, that device physics simulation is no match to these measured results. Okay, So this becomes a very big problem. This was the bottleneck that they were facing. So I gave them this a solution. Uh, fortunately, I could do it. Okay. 
So here, this will allow us to perfectly understand the behavior of the diodes in restricting the microwaves or in actually controlling the microwaves to different things for tunable resonators or you, uh, resonators being used in filters or uh, act as switches or uh, act as uh, such tunability and sw switching can be brought in other, not just filters, but also in the antennas. So all those passive devices that we talk about, which we do not uh, uh, actually fabricate inside a chip, uh, we need boards for that, circuit boards for that. Now we have something intermediate where we can put up these and uh, act and use switches as well, use the other uh, standard CMOS, uh, CMOS chips together integrated in that board. So here you can see a complete picture, complete system integration for future is that <coughs> where you can have all these, you know, uh, wideband filter and antenna being shown here. Of course, this is just a kind of schematic, you know, just a kind of view. This is not uh, something real. Uh, so here we, are, we can have, a high frequency RF block, uh, maybe using MMIC technology. We can use a low frequency RF block, uh, whether it is MMIC or uh, it is the standard CMOS. Uh, you can use it here, right? So it can be gallium nit nitride, gallium arsenide also, but it can be the standard silicon. So we are talking about the standard silicon fabrication. And we can have an analog module, digital module, and with this, we can have antennas. Here is a switch. We call it info switch because with the information, this is can, this can be switched on, switched off, and we can have variable attenuation. So the thing is that once we know the exact behavior of this, okay, we can model it, uh, model the exact behavior of this. We did not fabricate and fabricate it, test it, and then know about it. So if we have a model, mathematical model of it, before the fabrication, we already have a design equation, you know, so we can see that how much current, what doping and what kind of a diode can actually create exactly what kind of an attenuation for the isolation or exactly what kind of a, uh, you know, a range of links that, that can be adjusted, uh, resonator links that can be adjusted with these uh, kind of diode operations. Together with this, we can have usual uh, transistors. Uh, made from uh, scooping off few uh, some silicon and making NMOS, PMOS uh, through the standard CMOS process. We can also have a distributed transistor. We have been working on that. Just like the diode, we can actually make a transistor uh, there. And through those also, we can make uh, different kind of things like power amplifiers that I demonstrated, uh, that I showed I mean, uh, earlier in, in the initial slides. Okay, so uh, uh, so whether it is low noise amplifier or a power amplifier or a mixer, whatever uh, component we have in uh, telecommunications, we can do that. Okay, so and uh, here are the references. You can see the first one where you had uh, that uh, that gallium nitrate uh, Doherty power amplifier. That is. That's taken from this website, okay, that picture. Now, uh, the printed circuit board, which demonstrated the DVD player, uh, is taken from here. It's from the Wikipedia. Uh, the capacitor inductor resistor circuit that was uh, shown, it was taken from Malami. And the fourth one, the, the filter structure that you saw, was uh, is one of my papers published in 2013. It's in the National Journal of Electronics. This is an SCI journal, quite respected journal because it has, and you see it, it was published in 101st volume of the journal. Okay, so it had completed 100 years then by then, by the time. So uh, this is taken from there. And the mini uh, Bluetooth dual mode, uh, the, the other one, the Bluetooth module that you saw is taken from this side. And three interdigital capacitors, that's another, this is also taken from Wikipedia. Okay, and the reference number seven, which I was talking about, which is mostly talked in this slide, is this one reference number seven. You see, where I actually took up the challenge and modeled it. That's available, freely available. You don't have to do anything else. You can just go to the tech archive. You can just type my name and tech archive, put tech archive, you can reach this, you know, this one. And the eighth one, you see this one. Uh, 
this particular one this particular one uh, this is taken from uh, Cedric's uh, the, the Cedric was actually uh, my supervisor there okay Cedric Quendo uh, novel approaches to design of tunable devices this is this was held in Cocoa Beach Florida 2017 this has been taken from this conference paper and ninth was taken for one of my colleagues there uh, she is Roseanne Elenac, and she did this: the novel synthesis for band. It's switchable. This is this is published in 2020. One of the recent ones. Can I triply access this one? This one. This one. Okay. So you can add I triply access is also open access. So you can get hold of one of their papers. Yeah. Uh, no problem with that either. So here are the references. Now tell me, anything else that you would like to know? Anything else? Uh, see, uh, in there, you know, uh, this active substrate board, this is named by me. They had been using something else, SCSS silicon uh, doped area, something like this. So I didn't like that, that big name, you know, yeah, here it is. Semiconductor distributed doped area, SCDDA. This is what they are using. This this is the name that they are using. Okay, so I named it active substrate board. So if you type active substrate board, you may not be able to <laughs> get hold of any other paper than mine. Uh, it's uh, and if you want to, if you just just type this one, semiconductor distributed doped areas, you can get hold of a lot of papers by them. Okay, that is it. Uh, now tell me, any questions? Let me see. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking into your faces, just looking at the slides. You know, nobody has put the video on. So okay. So apart from the uh, apart okay, from the moderate, I, yes. I, actually, video has been disabled for everyone. Okay. Uh, okay. Fine. If you wish, okay, I, I, can, I can enable also from my side. No, no, fine. If you enable all of them, that becomes and, uh, yeah, a problem. That's right. Can I, I, I have enabled the uh, audio uh, uh, microphone okay. for, for everyone. So if anyone asks questions to set, so you can uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions because uh, I thought of speaking for one hour, which I did, and then uh, half an hour at least for the questions. Otherwise, there's no use. OK, I'll tell you one th one more thing uh, as an information. You see, I was talking about Schrockle equation, unable to model these. Uh, later on, when I came back from France, I actually found the Schrockle equation wrong. And I disproved it in one of my papers. You can find that out. That's called Modified General Diode Equation. And it's uh, published in IEEE Transactions in CAD for Integrated Circuits, OK? So uh, I'm the only person in the world who has disproved, theoretically disproved, a Nobel laureate. OK. So uh, you have a reading of that. And tell me whether you could understand. I think it is very easy to understand. And, and you can use it in different things. It can be used for. And there, you, the, the model which I made, uh, it somehow justify uh, the the paper which I wrote, uh, the modified general diode equation, somehow also justifies this kind, this this model as well, you know, because there were a lot of things people uh, were unable to understand. If you go to tech archive, you get uh, the relevant papers related to this this work. Okay. Uh, my rest of the work uh, uh, is the the PhD work was more on antenna arrays and antennas. Dr. Abhishek perhaps knows about it. We had the common supervisor, uh, Professor Mandel, uh, Professor D. Mandel. And uh, so most of my work was based on antennas. Before antennas, I had been working on microwave filters, uh, also some active devices like power amplifiers, the Doherty that I showed, I actually worked on those as well. Uh, and in teaching, I have, you see, 22 years spent in teaching. I taught almost every subject in electronics, some in mechanical engineering, some in uh, management. I don't know. 
how many I did. So you can ask me questions out of this this thing also. Okay, I'll try to handle those if I can. Hi. Uh, yes, I can hear you, but but its voice is quite feeble. Yes. Hello. Uh, are you tell me tell me whether i am uh, audible no. loud and clear or not yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You are loud and clear yeah. okay i still i'll, I'll put this microphone here so that i mean maybe okay uh, yes yes please is it audible sir ah yes sir uh, i will just explain that in some in some paper you have modified the software equation for the diode Yes, I modified the fundamental equation. That is uh, the general diode equation given by Shockley. Okay. Uh, which portion, uh, which parameter, particular parameter that has modified? It is actually the uh, resistance, bulk resistance. Okay. So what I uh, the, what is the difference between ideal diode equation and general diode equation? That's the only difference. The ideal diode equation doesn't have the bulk resistance connected, the series bulk resistance. Okay. Whereas the general diode equation has that bulk resistance, a series bulk resistance. Now, what I proved is that Shockley took this particular resistance series resistance, although he took it he took it in a wrong way because it does not follow the ohm's law it does not follow the circuit laws so the kirchhoff's laws okay so that is what what i proved and i also showed that his equation is accurate <coughs> my equation is accurate so i modified that part you know i made it compatible with the circuit theory the ohm's law and the circuit laws which prevailed before shockley and shockley created a new generation of devices which are called non ohmic devices okay so there are such devices like all the active devices which do not follow ohm's law i actually showed that they all follow ohm's law it's just a misunderstanding created by the wrong equation of shockley okay this is what i showed you uh, have a reading of it you can come back to me you can email me and if you wish to you know do something about that uh, you you are welcome you, if you wish to work with me on that you're welcome any anything else that you would like to know hello sir. Uh, hello uh, sir actually the maximum active devices uh. Uh, we have seen that some portion it is following the Ohm's law, but mm. uh, some uh, maximum portion it is uh, following the non ohmic but uh, two, uh, two law actually two, it is following simultaneously, as we know. The, the thing is, see, see, the point here is people confuse it. The problem is that when we say when a device is linear, we say it's a ohmic device okay mm -hmm. whenever it becomes non-linear it becomes non-ohmic device okay so there are portions in a diode structure in a diode say vi curve you can see there are portions which look almost linear we therefore we uh, sometimes model them as piecewise linear a small piece out of it is linear so piecewise mm -hmm. linear mm -hmm. so you put a lot of diodes together to model the, a single diode so it is like uh, instead of uh, putting a lot of bricks to make a building, you are uh, using a lot of building to make a single brick. Okay, is it not? If you if you require four diodes to model a single diode, that means you are somewhere wrong. Okay. Uh, no, sir. Just you have told you have proved that the uh, active devices previously that was uh, defined all all is not maintaining the ohmic's law. Mm. All device was the non ohmic, but mm. as we have studied that mm. the active device suppose transistor MOS, both mm. is actually following. This is the mix. Some portion is the ohmic, some portion is the non ohmic. But have you just justified no, no. that the, all the active devices have fully mm. ohmic? But you have what I what I what I what I actually demonstrated was that 
they are they can follow ohm's law and still be nonlinear okay so what i said is that the ohm's law has been constrictively uh, interpreted okay now i tell you see, something like say see uh, what is uh, flux density electric flux density d mm -hmm. how is it related to electric field intensity it is related by epsilon e. naught right mm -hmm. e or epsilon naught okay epsilon naught into e mm -hmm. so d is eps equal to epsilon naught into e now this epsilon naught is constant just like ohm's mm -hmm. law in ohm's law v equal to ir where you expect r is a constant similarly you have d is equal to epsilon naught into e where you expect epsilon naught to be constant but you know that epsilon naught is not always constant what happens to it if you change the material epsilon naught will epsilon will change permittivity will be changed okay. permittivity will change uh -huh. and this permittivity and if you keep on changing the material what will happen what will happen so, so, so it, instead, instead of a linear relationship instead of a linear relationship will be changed resistivity also will be changed right resistivity will also change but right now i'm just exemplifying it with the electromagnetic phenomena so that since you are all belong to the <coughs> microwave fraternity what i am explaining here is we never complained about the non-linearity of this equation d is equal to epsilon e this epsilon can change with the change of the material that doesn't make this d equal to epsilon e wrong false we never say oh this equation is followed only when epsilon is constant do we ever say that we don't say that then why do we say that v equal to ir if r is a constant only then it is oh, this, this 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 law is valid otherwise it is not valid ir mm -hmm. is a voltage draw now whether r is linear or non-linear variable or constant it doesn't matter ir is an absolute truth that means ir is a voltage drop that will always be voltage drop whether r changes or it doesn't are you getting my point or not mm -hmm. okay okay mm -hmm. so the thing is that with other things with other fundamental things like d and e relationship or b and uh, h relationship we are quite comfortable with variability of uh, epsilon and mu otherwise these are linear equations just like the ohm's law equation okay but we are not comfortable with v equal to ir if ir r changes oh ohm's law is not followed do we ever say uh, maxwell's laws are not followed these are maxwell's equations no if we change epsilon not maxwell laws are not valid that's that's uh, uh, ridiculous you see ridiculous understanding so uh, what i uh, what i did was i said see this r can vary and if r can vary because in a diode, what happens if we have a junction? That junction induces additional charges, additional mobile charges. Now, mm -hmm. what do we mean by additional mobile charges? If we uh, if we have additional mobile charges for a particular voltage, okay, that will uh, reduce the re resistance or resistivity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, this bulk resistance has been assumed as constant in Shockley's equation. What I showed was a uh, phenomena which people never thought about i introduced a phenomena called induced change in resistance okay so the junction no, with resistance the is, with the enhancing of the charges at the yes. junction yes the junction charges which has been enhanced those charges also also flows to the resistor bulk resistance connected to mm. it yes. okay so it will reduce the resistance of the bulk resistance as well. How can bulk resistance remain constant? That is as it is responsible for the um, flowing of the currents. So obviously, right. uh, reversely, the uh, that resistance will uh, in a decrease. Decrease. This, decrease. This, uh, right. The bulk decrease. So this has never been taken. So this is one of the mistakes of Shockley equation. Second is that the Shockley equation, uh, instead of that linear relationship of uh, the circuit law. It has you so Ohm's law is uh, agreed in the exponential form, but if you write it in the logarithmic form, you can see that Ohm's law is not agreed upon. IR this this IR product that doesn't exist there. In the, uh, so it has to 
what i mean is that you cannot just uh, had it been just a device you know uh, if I, I did not prove ideal diode equation wrong because it doesn't have a bulk resistance it's not a circuit but a general diode equation is a circuit where you have a device connected with another device then when it is circuit then it should follow circuit law right so that's that's the problem it did not follow circuit law and i showed how it can follow circuit law okay okay so okay. sir actually i have to study so, so, right. certainly that's why i asked you that yeah. you study if you are interested study you can get get back to me uh, yeah. if you do not understand anything and if you have no, 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 okay. uh, First, i have to study this one okay actually. right you have a look and you you can also uh, look into if you do not have the ieee access you know you mm. can uh, visit my tech archive uh, page there you will get a preprint of it of course the uh, the the complete uh, what mm. you say that uh, peer reviewed a version of the article is available only in the okay. ITP side. So another okay. question is that you have shown that uh, some graph of the um, mm. uh, IV characteristics. Mm. Okay. So using the device modeling uh, device physics simulator. Mm. So when uh, I mean, actually I want to clear the concept when you are using the single only the devices active components, but when you are uh, using the mixed up component passive or active, then device then device simulator will not actually uh, give the actual result no i did not mix any active and passive devices these are only the active devices in the uh, page 9 i think you have used the some mm -hmm. systems in this system mm -hmm. there are all the components are related and um, that is the uh, see, low which one? This, high can, you, can you see the slide can you see the slide uh, uh, can you see the slide which I'm on right right now? Hi, I think I think page number nine. Page okay. number nine. Last, slide last nine. one, last one. Which system you have given the block diagram? Okay. Okay, the la last one. It's not page last number one. nine. It's nineteen. Last last page, I think, before the references. Huh, so it's page eighteen. Okay. Maybe. Huh. So so can you see this? Can you see the slide? Is this what you're talking about? Uh, which one? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you which see this one? page? Uh, yes. Hmm. So where the uh, actually uh, systems you have used. Hmm. Okay. So this, hmm. uh, this system is combined of the all the uh, low RF, high RF, all the components. I think. Right. Right. So when you are using. So this is, so this is not used. You see, this is a schematic diagram. First, first, this understand. And what is the title here? Complete system integration in future for future. Okay. So, so this has never been done. Particularly for, for this, which types of the simulator we can use? We have to use various simulators. There is no single simulator available. Oh. Okay. And not just simulators. These simulators do not have the capability to handle it. And that is what before, I told you. Before the page, you have just highlighted the graph IV characteristics. Yes. And another you in the see, corner. In you the see, corner. Uh, when in my uh, model, see the calculated result. See, I have made in such the corner a corner of the corner of the left side. Top uh, yes. of the left side. Right. There are also the characteristics of the IV. What is the basic thing? It is not clear. Just uh, yes, I I, what I, want I to told you this. I'll tell you once again. Mm -hmm. See the diode that you have seen this diode it has been sliced just into a cross section which does not have any length can you see this la now this la has been reduced to zero okay with la reduced to zero this diode is simulated here because only then it can be this result can be obtained within few hours <laughs> otherwise they'll take days long okay mm -hmm. so this is the simulation of this particular cross section only not the length are you getting my point if i simulate the length i take the length then this is going to be a problem the simulator can run out of its uh, the memory capacity it can also take a lot of time maybe days okay. together okay, okay. Mm. i did not try it for more than 2 days but before me 
since they were struggling this for five years, they had tested it for eight days, what they had, they claim. That even after eight days, they could not get a result. Okay. If they simulate this entire thing, you know, because these simulators, device physics simulators, they are ma meant for <laughs> very small structures, not such big structures. Okay. 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 Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Anything else? Anything else? Anybody else has a question? Please ask. Okay, participants uh, who are would like to ask questions can raise their hand. I, I we will unmute from our side. Okay, sir, uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice presentations uh, regarding that uh, active substrate vote, which is a very promising area where we can do, do research uh, regarding the development of the microwave or millimeter wave circuits. Thank you for your presentations and uh, nice interactions with you also. And thank we, you. Are, thank you. Uh, we, we will be looking to interact with you very soon for further uh, different types of programs we will going to organize or anyone uh, going to do research in this area can obviously yes. uh, interact with uh, yes with any, any research in electronics engineering for any research in electronics engineering you can contact me because the research trust the research institute which i have formed it is okay. supposed to cater to all branches of electronics you okay. can visit my site click for applied research in electronics uh, it is carrot site dot in uh, i'll show you yeah yeah just show, show us site.in you just uh, type this what happened yeah it's uh, yeah here it is so can you see this click yes, for sir. applied research in electronic technology this is the site okay yes sir. yes so you can uh, you can visit this site uh, and know about anything new that comes up or you can also contact like you can go to contacts and you can see uh, the email ids are given here okay okay, okay, okay you okay. can contact you can directly contact me as well okay you know? okay 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 and uh, through uh, my lab program we can also collaborate okay, okay there right. are you can go to this collab section you can see uh, what we what it entails mm -hmm. you know we are uh, planning to collaborate with different uh, colleges those can be national level uh, institutes as well as uh, some private colleges okay mm -hmm. uh, we can do joint research we can do that all that all those things okay, okay. but it okay. depends upon what's what's uh, our will and how serious are we about it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So okay thank you sir thank you very much okay, thank, you. Your thank you and for your valuable time uh, thank you. okay so with this uh, uh, our next uh, presenter uh, or, uh, Eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Gopiram has joined in this session. So I'd like to request uh, Professor uh, Gopiram uh, to bear us for five minutes for a bio break. So Professor Gopiram, uh, can you allow us for five minutes break? Uh, you can unmute yourself, sir. Uh, yes, sir, please. OK, so, so after five minutes, uh, we are just coming back. OK, OK, no issue, no issue. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, participants are requested to take a short bio break. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for your presence. And our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Gopiram, who is the senior member of IEEE and IT. He has done his uh, B degree from in electronics and communication, telecommunication engineering from Government Engineering College, Jagdalpur, Chhattisgarh. He received MTech and PhD degrees from NIT Durgapur. He received the scholarship from MHRD, Government of India, during his MTech and PhD degree. Later, he joined NIT Warangal as an assistant professor in EC department. His research area includes 
antenna and antenna array design, analysis and synthesis of radiation pattern, time modulated antenna array structures, design of antennas for wireless power transfer, design DOA estimation and beam forming, frequency diverse antenna array, electro directive antennas, MIMO antennas, 5G, 6G antennas, wideband antennas, soft computing technologies. Uh, he has published more than 90 research papers in peer-reviewed international journals and conferences. Uh, currently, he has is guiding seven PhD students under his guidance. So, with this brief introductions, Professor Gopiram, I'd like to hand over the session to you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. So make it, <coughs> make it just full screen, sir. OK, fine. Is it OK? Fine. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone uh, so in today's uh, talk i'm going to discuss about the time modulated antenna arrays and uh, if if time permits i'll try to uh, introduce about the how the time modulated antenna arrays are done uh, for the synthesis as as well as the analysis and how we apply the soft computing techniques in the time modulated antenna arrays. So basically, this is the uh, uh, recent advancement in the pattern synthesis of the antenna arrays. Generally, we know that uh, there are some conventional uh, time uh, conventional arrays uh, which are having uh, linear arrays, planar arrays. Is my voice okay? Yes, sir. Clear and oh, loud. Okay, fine, fine. So uh, we know that uh, there are some conventional uh, arrays, uh, which are uh, nothing but uh, linear antenna arrays, circular antenna arrays, or planar structures of the any combination uh, of those geometry as well as the hybrid uh, arrays. So the, the concept of time modulation is the novel. Uh, it's not, in fact, the novel, but uh, the development happened uh, for the time modulated antenna arrays is from the 2000 onwards. Earlier, the concept was given in 1959, but there was not much research on the development of the time modulated. But after 2000, there was a huge uh, progress in the area of time modulated antenna arrays. And still, these uh, areas are going to continue for the different structure. And people are going to utilize this time modulated for the various technologies like 5G communication, 6G communication. Then the recent development in the time modulated antenna is our wireless power transfer technique. So in this talk, basically I'm going to discuss some basic concept as well as the, uh, the how the synthesis will be done in the time modulated using the evolutionary optimization technique. So we know that uh, the antenna arrays uh, there are several antennas can be arranged in this space interconnected to produce the directional pattern, right? And we have the different geometries like linear geometry, circular geometries, planar geometries, the conformal geometries. These geometries are depending on the applications. We are going to utilize these particular geometries. As well as nowadays, we have uh, the hybrid structure as well. Uh, like uh, hexagonal structure, we have elliptical structure, conical structure, depending on the availability of the space for the particular application. And these applications of the arrays, we know that to increase the gain, to provide the diversity reception. If you want to inter uh, cancel out the interference from some particular direction, we are going to uh, utilize the arrays and we are going to utilize the beam, beam steering concept also with the help of array. So this straightforward thing is that when we, when we want to 
do the synthesis, then we are going for the pattern uh, antenna arrays concept. So when we talk about the uh, antenna arrays, why we require the antenna arrays? Because the problem is with the single antenna, the radiation pattern of the single element is relatively wide. Right, so if you want to increase the gain in directivity, the enlarging the dimension is the one of the solution of the each element. If you are going for the array, so uh, so what is the solution? If you, if you are going to enlarge the dimension of the elements, and obviously it is going to be much complex as well as the the design complexity will be more. So what is the solution in that case? The arrangement of the identical antenna element in the array format, depending on the requirement. Maybe we can arrange in a linear fashion, we can arrange in a uh, circular fashion or any arbitrary uh, structure uh, depend where we can calculate the array pattern. So basically uh, there we are going to do the vector addition of the field uh, for the radiated, uh, the radiated intensity by the individual pattern, right? So those patterns can be controlled with the help of geometrical configuration with the help of excitation weights, phase, how we are going to provide the phase, and how we are going to keep the inter-element spacing, right? So uh, these are the, uh, the control parameters. One is the geometrical configuration. So uh, first of all, we can choose the what type of geometry we are going to uh, utilize. Then once you have done the uh, geometrical selection, based on the geometrical selection, or how many number of elements are in the array, and how we are going to provide the weights, how we are going to give the excitation phase, and what is the, uh, the inter-element spacing we are going to provide. And also, when we talk about the, uh, the relative pattern of the individual antenna elements. So suppose if you are going to have the array of dipole antenna, array of micro -strip patch antenna, or whatever the individual elements are there, so that particular individual elements radiation property is also going to account for the calculation of the total radiation pattern. And that also comes for the control uh, of the radiation pattern. So based on the, these are the basic uh, uh, understanding of uh, these, these fundamental things that what is the antenna array and how, why we go for the antenna arrays. Basically we require the high gain and high directivity for the long distance communication, then in that case, we require the antenna array, right? So basically, if you categorize the uh, types of the research is going on, is element level and the array level. People are mostly working on this particular domain. Either people are working on the element development of the elements, different structure they are going to design, different material properties they are going to analyze, different polarization properties they are going to analyze, in the particular element level. And the second one is the array level where once these element levels are done, our, 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 this uh, array level concept is going to come. And mostly what I mean to say in this particular array level is pe people are working on the array factor concept. So these two uh, things are going to happen or these are the research going to happen in this particular as of now scenario. So coming to this, uh, the concept of the time modulated antenna array, what are the time modulated antenna array? Uh, first we'll discuss the, what are the advantage of the time modulation technique. So uh, from here only we, uh, we can have the, some clearance about time modulation technique. So here we know that when we talk about the conventional technique, we have uh, the, uh, as we discussed that when we, when we talk about the, particular geometry, we have the three control parameters, like how we are going to give the excitation, how we are going to give the phase, and how we are going to provide the inter-element spacing in the array. So these are the, the conventional control parameter when we choose the particular antenna arrays. So here, the time modulation antenna, time modulated antenna arrays, we are going to provide the additional control parameter, which is called as a additional degree of freedom, which is uh, nothing but a, as a time. So each antenna is connected with the switch, which is connected with the RF switch and that RF switch we are going to turn on or turn off 
for that particular uh, scenario and this turn off and time turn on uh, will be controlled by the time modulation period of the switch and the average radiation pattern is provided in the total uh, time modulated antenna rays. So this is the one additional degree of freedom we are going to give. That means we are going to get the additional control parameter out of three, we are going to get uh, one more additional parameter to control the radiation pattern. That's the reason uh, this uh, structure is also called as a 4D arrays, four dimensional uh, time modulated or four dimensional antenna arrays. The second one is the ultra side lobe reduction as compared to the conventional array. So what we have observed in, in the research, in our research that in comparison with the conventional array, since we it is going to provide the additional degree of freedom, we are going to see the additional uh, reduction of the side lobe that is ultra side lobe, uh, we can say as compared to the conventional array. The third one is automatic beam steering without the use of phase shifter. So this is the one of the major application now people are targeting on that is automatic beam steering without the use of phase shifter. Because we know that when we talk about the conventional phased antenna arrays, we require the phase shifters, right? So by time modulation concept, we can achieve the beam steering concept uh, by controlling the uh, switching sequence of the uh, RF switch, how we are going to, uh, that is nothing but the optimizing the RF switch in a such a way that the beams are getting steered uh, based on the time sequence. And in that case, we don't additionally require the phase shifter based on the uh, switching sequence of this, uh, uh, of this uh, RF switch, we can control the beam steering in this particular array structure. The fourth one is the uh, free from the dynamic range ratio, which is nothing but we know that uh, when we talk about the feed network design uh, and in uh, the conventional structure, we when we are going for the excitation of this each and individual element, in that case, what we observe that uh, when we are talking about the dynamic range ratio, which is nothing but the highest amplitude to the lowest amplitude, and in that case, we have seen that conventional concept of uh, the JBC and uh, Taylor distribution. In that case, binomial distribution as well as the JBC distribution, we, if you take the dynamic range ratio, it is very large. So the designing of the feed network is, uh, is going to be a complex. So that can be avoided with the help of time modulation because we can keep the excitation amplitude as a constant instead of, uh, doing the optimization, we can keep the amplitude as a constant and by varying the, uh, the switching sequence or optimizing the switching sequence, we can, uh, we can control the, uh, the dynamic range ratio as well as the uh, radiation pattern. And the last one is nothing but easy to implement the RF switch because we know that the VLSI domain has been already developed so that we can, we can uh, generate the or we can implement the switch as compared to the phase shifter very easily so uh, what are the uh, some features of the time modulated antenna is in the era of 5g's is nothing but as we discussed that time modulated for the multi-user communication so this di diagram shows that we uh, each uh, this is nothing but a circular geometry this geometries uh, is antennas are arranged in the circular geometry and each antennas are connected with the switch. So if this is the part of the time modulated concept where each switch is uh, connected with the antenna and these switching uh, sequences are provided with the help of the optimization technique, how we are going to give. So based on the optimization, you can either control the harmonics as well as the fundamental beam or you can steer the harmonic also. We will understand that what is the harmonic in the time modulated concept. So this is the one of the structure for the multi-user communication. Now we have the uh, MIMO application also where we have the base station and the mobile station. So this, uh, the dedicated beams can be uh, connected with, with, from the base station to the mobile station. So this is one of the application uh, the in the time modulated concept 
where when we talk about the time modulated concept, we have the fundamental beam as well as the harmonic beam. Because when we talk about the uh, the RF switch connected with the each antenna, we have some of the uh, the harmonic beam generated. So with the help of the proper switching sequence or proper optimizing the switching sequence, we can utilize the harmonic beams for the for the multi-user uh, MIMO application. So these beams uh, can be connected with the direct communication link. Now we can see that uh, the time modulated antenna for cognitive radio application. In that case, you can see the uh, right side here. Uh, these uh, radiation patterns are shown. The H is equal to zero is representing your fundamental pattern. And the green dotted green color is representing your first harmonic and the, the blue dotted uh, color is representing your the second harmonic. So this is how we are going to get with the help of normalized switching on switch on sequence of the uh, of the antenna. So this is uh, the 16 element antenna. So x axis is representing the number of element and the y axis is representing your normalized switch on sequence. So based on that we are giving the switching sequence in a such a way that the first element and the, the two 16 element at the different time sequence are provided and this time sequence are optimized in a such a way that we are going to get the beam steering concept in this particular radiation pattern so this beam steering we don't require the phase shifter additionally we don't require the phase shifter we are connected with the the rf switch and based on the rf switch we are we are we are uh, uh, controlling the radiation pattern of the fundamental as well as the harmonic beam. So the same same concept we can apply for the reduction of the side lobe as well as the sideband level. So sideband level is nothing but which is related with the uh, the harmonics of the radiated time modulated pattern. So based on this, we can utilize the harmonics. Uh, this harmonics, uh, which is nothing but this dotted and this dotted, we can utilize. So here we are representing only uh, two. Uh, harmonics, the fundamental harmonics and the second harmonics. Now coming to the, uh, let's try to understand it, uh, what is the time modulated linear antenna is because uh, when we talk about the conventional uh, technique, we have uh, the uh, array factor equation for the time modulated, uh, for the linear antenna. When we talk about the time modulated antenna is what are the changes in the array factor is going to come. So we know that uh, for the this is the one simple example of this uh, linear antenna. Uh, so we know that the RF factor is given by this expression. This is well known expression, and it is it can be found in the any standard textbook like uh, Balanis as well as the Krauss. So this is nothing but your RF factor of the linear RF factor, which is arranged in along along with this z axis, and it is asymmetric asymmetric uh, configuration. So each antenna is connected with the uh, is with the some amplitude which is represented as I n here, right? So and the spacing between the element is a d here, and uh, uh, this is the array factor and the phase shift constant is k here. So uh, the total array factor is given by this particular expression, and the theta is representing your angle of radiation of the electromagnetic plane wave, which is nothing but the elevation angle here. And the uh, the total number of element here is nothing but capital N. And uh, the based on that, uh, we are going to consider that. Let's try to understand the capital N is uh, nothing but let's try to say that it is a total number of element is 16. Then how the radiation pattern and how the switching sequence are going to be connected. So instead of this is the uh, the time model, uh, this is the not uh, time model. This is a conventional uh, antenna array the array factor of the conventional antenna array. When we are connecting the each antenna, the n number of element is connected with the each switch here. So this is represented as uh, the switch. So this switch is connected with each element and this switch will be controlled. Uh, this switch will be controlled uh, based on the, uh, the uh, some, some of the uh, FPGA board or some, uh, based on this, we are going to give the sequence at what sequence we are going to connect with this particular element and how these elements will be on and off depending on this particular switch. And based on the time average radiation pattern will be plotted 
and based on the time average radiation pattern you will be getting the radiated uh, radiated beam of the time moderated linear antenna array so the total array factor is represented here ift here which is nothing but uh, here you have af so because of this time moderated we are representing the time uh, function is also coming here so we are representing in general we are representing the time moderated array factor we are representing as af theta because we are connecting the each an antenna or each this these are the uh, antennas so these antennas are connected with the switch and based on that rf the total rf factor is represented by f theta into t so how uh, we know that uh, how do we write this rf factor uh, this is because of the periodic nature f not of this uh, the, uh, the f not is representing your uh, the fundamental uh, frequency and here the rf factor is represented with this particular expression we are we are connecting with unt unt is nothing but the switching sequence of this particular antenna so n is represent uh, the subserif n is representing here how this uh, this particular switching sequence is provided to this particular antenna unt is representing this particular antenna. so for for un1 un2 so for number of element unt unt is representing so for each antenna we are connecting with the switch and this switch is connected with the particular antenna and this switching sequence is given to this particular antenna and out of that based on this uh, time average radiation radiation pattern will be calculated and this will be the uh, after applying the time modulation uh, where the time modulation equation can be rewritten by this particular expression so uh, since we are interested here the uh, the how we this periodic time sequence is given by so unt is represented by this particular value so how we are representing this it is given as a one for uh, for t greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to <coughs> tau n so tau n is nothing but the uh, the duration here yeah, the duration for which that particular antenna is on so when it is on we are representing unt as a one and otherwise we are representing as a zero and sometimes uh, in the literature if you see some uh, some of the research paper uh, here uh, there are two type of representation you will find out here so people are utilizing the on sequence as well as the off sequence so instead of writing the tau n they will be writing as a at what time this uh, t off and t in terms of t off and t on but the representation here it is tau n is representing the duration for which this particular antenna is uh, on it is it is not representing that at which particular instant it is going to be on and which particular state it is going to be off so that expression can also be written but in this case we are representing here tau n uh, this is representing the duration only at what instant it is on or what instant it is off that is not representing here right so this umt is represented here so suppose the rf factor operate at the uh, f not in uh, in the uh, f not in hertz and the t not is the time period of the operating frequency so t not we are representing as a uh, uh, the f uh, uh, t not is represented with connected with the fundamental frequency and the time modulation period which is represented as a switching sequence is represented as a tp and employing the time modulation frequencies fp is equal to 1 by tp so this f not is re related with the t not and tp is related with the fp and the freak this is the uh, the uh, the fundamental frequency this is the fundamental frequency f not is representing your fundamental frequency or we can say the operating frequency and tp is representing your time modulation frequency which is connected switch is connected here so uh, this switch is connected here so for what you can see from this particular diagram here so since it is a normalized time so for what time it is going to be uh, on and what time it is going to be off so since the representation of this particular array factor this particular array factor here we are writing as a uh, tau n it is representing the duration only and this obviously because we are talking about the time modulation period of the uh, uh, modulating switch or which is connected with the switch 
the frequency of this particular switch at the time modulation frequency uh, will be very less than the operating frequency or the fundamental frequency. So this is the one uh, concept we have to take care of that. The when we are talking about the operating frequency and when we are talking about the time uh, time modulation frequency. So time modulation frequency is related with the switch and the operating frequency is related with the signal, right? So when we connect, uh, because uh, the switch is connected, on off uh, function is there, a swing switch is connected with this each uh, antenna, the time domain representation can be done in the Fourier, Fourier series because we require the Fourier frequency domain anal analysis. So in that case, this time uh, domain can be converted into the frequency domain with the help of Fourier series. And this is these are the periodic uh, function, the time, uh, the switching sequence which we are going to give, which is a, a periodic function. And that periodic function uh, is converted uh, for the frequency uh, domain analysis, it is converted into the Fourier, uh, <coughs> Fourier series. So this is the expression for the Fourier series. And from there, we can write as a the complex amplitude IMM. So I, M is representing your harmonic component. M is representing your harmonic component and N is representing the number of element. So I N is related with your amplitude of the uh, uh, antenna. Tau N is related with the with this your uh, uh, duration for which the particular anti uh, particular antenna is on. And this T P is related with the time period of the switch. Out of this particular time period, how much of the duration this particular antenna or particular switch is connected or that particular switch which is connected to the antenna is on. So uh, here again, I would like to mention you when we write out, uh, write in terms of T off and T on, in that case, the expression will be different that in that situation, we will be writing in terms of T off minus T n. And this is the function, uh, the same function, which when we solve this, uh, we will be getting this particular IMN expression. So this M is representing with the uh, this harmonic component because we are, we are writing here M is equal to minus infinity to infinity. When, when we are converting to the time domain, the periodic function to the frequency domain or with the help of Fourier series. So this M is representing your the uh, harmonic component. So when, when we talk about the fundamental harmonic, obviously M will be zero. In that case, we can write as a I zero N as a I N divided by tau n by tp. So this will be the, the uh, complex amplitude when we will be talking about the fundamental frequency. Since here the periodic switch is connected to the H antenna and this because of this periodic switch, we are getting this, uh, this particular function into the array factor. We are going to get the harmonic component because here we are having the harmonic component where uh, minus infinity to infinity and m is equal to zero is representing the fundamental bit. So here uh, I zero n is representing your I n tau n by T p and I one n is representing your uh, fundamental uh, first positive harmonics. Obviously we can have the positive and negative harmonics because here we are, it is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we can have the plus positive harmonic or plus negative harmonic. So when we're talking about the positive first harmonic, it can be a positive negative harmonics also, positive second harmonics, positive uh, second negative harmonics also. But here, if you write in terms of the first harmonic, we are, so uh, obviously you can write a plus minus here uh, in terms of the fundamental, uh, fundament, uh, fundamental as well. For fundamental, it will be zero. For the first harmonic and second harmonic, you can write plus and minus. So for the second harmony, here I am representing only positive harmony. So when we talk about this, uh, the total array factor here, so we have started from this expression UNT. So if you convert this in terms of frequency domain, and if you see the individual component of the first harmonic and the first positive harmonic for second uh, harmonics, in that case, the, uh, the, the total array factor in terms of the uh, uh, all the harmonic component where m is equal to minus infinity to infinity, this expression uh, will become for the time modulated array factor. So this component is because of this particular switching sequence, 
so there is double summation which is going from m is equal to minus infinity to infinity n is equal to 1 to capital and this uh, the uh, the normal expression of the linear antenna will become the time modulated antenna where we are considering the fundamental as well as the harmonic component so the for uh, when we talk about the far field contents the mth harmonic frequency component which is nothing but m is equal to 0 m, m is equal to plus minus 1 m is equal to plus minus 2 and so on but when we are talking about the particular frequency a particular component we if you are interested to this particular component here we are writing as a this particular expression if you are if you are interested to that fundamental or m is equal to uh, uh, if you are interested for the particular component it may be fundamental component or it may be the harmonic component then uh, the sum of infinite number of harmonic component for the nth of the harmonic frequency component can be written as this expression so this is the simplified version of this particular expression where we are writing for this nth order harmonic frequency so from here we can we can write the expression for the fundamental which will be the ultimate expression for your uh, time modulated antenna arrays for the fundamental frequency so this will be your uh, this already we have seen the imn expression this imn expression is coming from this particular uh, expression imn is m is equal to 0 so for m is equal to the a0 theta naught we will be getting this particular expression with exponential component these are the component which is already available uh, available with the uh, the uh, uh, conventional time modulated uh, conventional arrays <coughs> but when we talk about the array factor we are interested in the uh, magnitude pattern so still uh, this this is the phase component so if you are interested with the magnitude component so this this only will be the final expression for the radiation plot of the antenna array. similarly for the fundamental positive first harmonic for the positive first harmonic will be representing this uh, so this term will be coming from here uh, this expression will be coming from this for the first harmonic and from the second harmonics so this can be represented for the fundamental uh, harmonic the first harmonic will be this one and the second harmonic will be this one so remember here what i am representing is nothing but positive first harmonic and positive negative harmonics now uh, this is the uh, the array factor of the uh, time modulated antenna array so once we have evaluated uh, this array factor for the time modulation the pattern synthesis can be done uh, easily uh, depending on the control parameter of the time modulated antenna. Since we have said that the time modulated antenna array will be having the fourth dimensional parameter, it will be having the time also as a control parameter. So we will have the more flexibility to control the radiation pattern. But the geometry point of view, uh, the it can be having a it can be having a linear also it can be having a circular also it can be having a concentric circular also and the hexagonal also so uh, in our research we have we have worked for the uh, linear time modulated linear antenna time modulated circular antenna time modulated concentric circular antenna even uh, for the hexagonal array structure also we have worked on that and uh, uh, nowadays we are working for the uh, those structure we are utilizing for this uh, wireless power transfer so one of my phd student is working on the time modulation concept for the wireless power transfer uh, those area also we are going to we are working on that so the, once we have done this array factor calculation we can have the pattern synthesis of the uh, this particular antenna array so uh, how do we calculate the directivity when we talk about the time modulation concept so we uh, require the other parameters like uh, to evaluate the performance of the antenna array. so these are the parameters to evaluate the uh, the radiation pad radiation characteristics so how do we calculate the directivity and how do we calculate the uh, uh, directivity for the tmla so for the tml is nothing but time modulated linear antenna arrays so in that case, uh, the expression for the time modulated uh, for, for the calculation of the directivity for the time modulated will be in this way. So here we are uh, considering the m is equal to minus infinity to uh, 
to the input. So this is the periodated component and this is the, the maximum radiation intensity component. But the question comes that uh, when we talk about the minus infinity to infinity, uh, I would like to say you that when we talk about the harmonic component, uh, so basically the uh, it can say that uh, up to five fifth order, fifth positive and uh, fifth negative harmonic component will have the 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 uh, the power level much, but the remaining will have the very low power level. So so far in the particular in the current scenario, the people. Uh, uh, which they are working on the time modulation concept. The more, most of the other uh, US country people are Italy in Europe also, they, uh, these, they are working on the time modulation concept. So they are utilizing uh, basically maximum up to uh, the first positive harmonic, first negative harmonic, and the first second harmonics, uh, second harmonics, as well as the second negative harmonic. So, so far people have used uh, for the up to two harmonic only because the power level uh, in the uh, the uh, the harmonic components are low when it is going to be increase the when the harmonic number is going to increase the power levels are going to be uh, very low so it is uh, it will become the no use uh, for the calculation uh, for the directivity obviously there will be a small value that can be negligible but when we talk about the harmonic uh, concept like beam steering concept for the beam steering concept People are working for up to maximum up to uh, third harmonic or fourth harmonic for the individual uh, information transmission. So this is the uh, the calculation of the directivity. Now coming to the uh, how do we uh, when we uh, am, am, as I'm uh, talking about the the how can we do the uh, the pattern synthesis in that case. So we have understood that how the uh, what is the time modulation concept. So how do we calculate the uh, the array factor for the time modulation? Once we have done the uh, the array factor calculation for the time modulation, uh, how do we do the uh, pattern synthesis? So when we talk about the pattern synthesis, we have the uh, conventional approach as well as the non-conventional approach. So when we talk about the non-conventional approach, we we need to go for some of the optimization techniques. So uh, right now we are working on the non-conventional approach which are the evolutionary optimization based uh, techniques and uh, when we go for the evolutionary optimization technique we require the uh, one function which is called as the cost function or objective function right so in that case uh, the objective function and cost functions are more or less same uh, uh, what we do for the conventional approach here also we are going to do uh, the same way, but the fitness function will be little uh, uh, varied because here we are talking about the fundamental uh, pattern as well as the uh, the sideband pattern. So this SL is SLL is representing your side lobe level of the fundamental beam. So there are there are some terminologies when we talk about the the time modulation concept. So when uh, in comparison with the conventional approach, we talk about the side lobe level only which is uh, called as a SLL, right? And when we talk about the time modulation concept, we have the side lobe level as well as the side band level. So terminology, uh, the, this side band level terminology is related with your harmonic component. And this side lobe level is uh, related with your fundamental component. So here, that's the reason here we are representing the side lobe level, which is associated with the fundamental frequency, which is F naught frequency. Now, uh, the second component is sideband level component, which is associated with the harmonic component. So harmonic component, uh, since we are talking about only in this particular expression, we are talking about the only two component, first, first uh, positive harmonic and first uh, second uh, positive harmonics. So this, this SBL is re related with your, with your, the, uh, the harmonic component, harmonic component and the that means you can say the the radiation pattern of the uh, the m is equal to one or m is equal to two or so on. So those radiation pattern we call as a SBL or side band level. Right? So here, depending on the op application, if you are going to minimize the side side band level, then 
the cost function will be different and the technique for the uh, for the uh, the pa pattern synthesis using the time sequence analysis will be different when we talk about the beam string so our uh, our time sequence should be in a such a way that the uh, the time sequence should be in a such a way that when we are converting into the frequency uh, domain it is going to give the progressive phase shift however it is uh, we are not using the uh, the phase shift physically but the concept of the the switching sequence applying the concept of the phase shifting uh, based on the time modulation so time domain to frequency domain it is going to convert into the phase variation time delay phase variation so we are going to provide the switching sequence in a such a way that we are going to get the progressive phase in the uh, in the frequency domain so in that sense uh, the similar concept we what we apply in case of uh, in case of uh, the phased antenna rays here we are using the switching sequence to apply this beam steering concept but in that case your fitness functions will be little bit different but however here i have not mentioned the the particular fitness function but in that case your switching sequence uh, are optimizing where a uh, variable parameter should be in a such way that you are going to give the progressive uh, manner to optimize the time sequence so this is the one cost function second cost function we can use if you are going to use the directivity concept then we are going to use this uh, this sort of uh, uh, the cost function which is nothing but uh, your array factor maximum side lobe level as well as the maximum at the uh, maximum direction so this will be the side lobe area in the side lobe area what is the maximum value of the side lobe level and this is the related with your maximum value of the array factor the second component is representing your 1 by d maximum so here it is actually the cost functions are designed with the weighted function which is w1 and w2 so here this is minimization function and this is also minimization function but here we have written as a 1 by d maximum because uh, this directivity and side lobe level it is a contradictory in a nature we know that uh, here side lobe level is a minimization but directivity always we want to have the improvisation in the directivity so the cost function it can be either minimization function or maximization function so uh, we can use the uh, multi objective concept also by applying some weightage so w1 and w2 is given here so this is a minimization and 1 by d maximum so indirectly we are maximizing the directivity and we are taking as a 1 by d maximum which is giving as a minimization of this particular function so this sort of cost function we can uh, design it for the more uh, understanding if you are some of you are interested or some of you are working on this particular pattern synthesis uh, they can go with uh, our some of the research paper you can you can find the various cost function for the various application for the various geometry here since uh, we have the time constraint we, i cannot explain all the cost function so i have just mentioned two cost function here now once we have done the cost function uh, uh, how do we uh, go for the uh, the uh, pattern synthesis so uh, since we uh, we are working on the time modulation concept we are working on the pattern synthesis of this antenna rays so how we are doing the pattern synthesis we are designing uh, the cost function and you are utilizing the cost function with the help of uh, some of the evolutionary optimization technique so how this evolutionary optimization techniques are going to be utilized that i am going to discuss here in a brief manner <clears throat> so uh, when we talk about the uh, optimization is nothing but the process of finding the best one out of the all the feasible solution we you might be having some of the solution but uh, out out of that what is the feasible solution so we have some of the traditional method uh, or we can say that conventional approach like exhaustive search method but uh, for those we require some of the condition that it should be a, it should be derivative and it should be a, a one of the condition is nothing but it is it should be de, uh, it is it should be derivative right? so exhaustive search method one one of the condition is it should be derivative but this will going to give is nothing but one solution at a time if you have here you have x minimum 
here you have x ma maximum out of that you will be getting one solution at a time and we know that uh, uh, the initial solution the initial condition or the first solution will be leading you uh, either convergence or uh, divergence right so it is always important that how we are choosing your initial values uh, to uh, go for this particular traditional method so these are called as a single agent for finding the optimal solution using the gradient search gradient search then exhaustive search method these are the the uh, the single agent method, method so we are going to have the the direction of the negative gradient so one solution first we are finding so this one solution will become important that how this first solution is going to give and depending on that the remaining iteration is going to uh, get the solution so this is the uh, the single agent for the finding the optimal solution using the gradient search or the any conventional approach you say uh, this will be your the at a time you will be getting single solution when we talk about the multi multi model solution or discontinuous function in that case suppose you take the example of this <coughs> this function here we have the the multiple local minima and multiple local maxima so if you go for this uh, particular single agent problem there is a possibility that this particular solution is going to be stuck at the particular local minima so this type of function uh, when we talk about the multi model or discontinuous function we cannot solve this uh, this particular this type of problem with the help of this because there is a high chance to get uh, stuck onto the local minima instead of getting the global uh, minima or global maxima if it is a maximization problem obviously we will be looking for the uh, global maxima in that case it will not reach or most of the time it is a it is having the possibility that it may uh, step into the local minima so in that scenario what is going to happen it's we are going to target for the multi agent optimization so multi agent optimization will lead us to understand the concept of the evolutionary approach right so this multi agent optimization is nothing but here we have the solution space so we are starting from the different location and different positions and we'll try to understand uh, uh, or share the information between the each other that which direction we should move and which direction we should not move and how we should update our information with each other so most of the uh, evolutionary optimization technique are based on this particular concept in uh, only so sharing the information between the each other and there are different names uh, are available if you see the uh, the optimization technique or evolutionary approach there are plenty of algorithms but if you see the basic concept the basic concept is nothing but the sharing the information only so these are that nothing but they randomly initialize an agent within the solution space and out of that they will be sharing their information so these are the agents and after that the information one solution will be reaching to the global so most are near global and out of that we will be getting this as a solution so this how they are moving because when when we talk about the solution is space here so these different agents how they are moving and this how what is the direction of their movement and what is the steps they are taking about uh, this is all about your evolutionary approach with help of the different uh, algorithms right so when we talk about the conventional approach we require the continuous function as well as the differentiable function uh, it, uh, this is a minimum desirable uh, things uh, to utilize the classical optimization uh, technique it must the function must be a continuous as well as the differentiable but when we talk about these the uh, array factors equations these are non continuous as well as non differentiable function in that case we cannot utilize this uh, the classical optimization technique and most of the time we will stuck into the local minimum so the better solution is to use some of the evolutionary approach to synthesize this particular uh, radiation pattern of the arrays so uh, these are the uh, these are the approach uh, we are going to uh, utilize for the 
synthesis of the radiation pattern with the help of some of the evolutionary optimization technique. We are choosing because the array factors are highly non-differentiable as well as the non-continuous. So there are some approach, uh, the, uh, <coughs> there are some uh, method because uh, when we talk about this different optimization techniques, so this is the flow chart the block diagram of the evolutionary optimization technique. This uh, blo block diagram is talking about most, almost all the approach. We have the optimization, then we have the optimizing variable parameter, then performance result, depending on the cost function, how, how do we uh, utilize this cost function, whether it is for minimization or maximization. And based on this analytical model or empirical model, because uh, it may happen that sometimes we are not directly uh, minimizing the function because when we suppose we have some polynomial equation we can directly mi minimize so these are the analytical model we are talking about but when we talk about the empirical model because in case of array factor you have the minimization as well as the uh, maximization because you cannot simply minimize all the function because you have the main beam direction as well as the side lobe direction where you want to minimize the side lobe as well as the maximize the uh, value of the maximum radiation. So you have in one factor, you have the side lobe level as well as the main beam. So in that case, we need to design the, uh, the empirical formula. So empirical formula uh, is uh, represented here in terms of cost function, which we have represented here. So these cost function are representing the empirical formulas. So in that case, these fitness functions are written as an empirical formula instead of writing as a direct analytical method some of the uh, analytical ma analytical model which will be uh, required to reduce the particular function, complete function reduction. So in that scenario, we will be using the analytical model. So actually what we require when we talk about the uh, uh, optimization. So we require a modeling, we require optimization techniques, we require the objective functions, right? We require a design variable as well as the constraint. So these are the only requirement uh, when we uh, talk about the optimization and where it can be used, it, not only in the domain of the uh, microwave, it can be utilized for this uh, communication, it can be utilized for the VLSI, even in other engineering branches like mechanical engineering, civil engineering, computer science engineering, this, they are utilizing this of the uh, evolutionary optimization techniques for their problem. Uh, which can not be solved with this uh, the conventional approach, right? So uh, basically it is nothing but the population-based met metaheuristic algorithm, which is nothing but uh, use the, the mechanism inspired by the biological evolution, such as uh, reproduction, mutation, the recombination, as well as the selection. So uh, it is basically uh, the concept is Darwin's postulation of the survival of the fittest, how we are going to survive with the, with the help of the, uh, with the uh, different environmental condition, which is nothing but it is mimicking the biological evolutionary process for the reproduction, mutation, recombination, and selection, etc. So depending on the different uh, optimization uh, technique or name of the optimization technique, there are uh, different process, but overall procedure is nothing but the this the same that how it is going to survive for the fittest. So we have the different uh, name like uh, the based on the biological adoption or evolution, we have the genetic algorithm, genetic programming, evolution strategies, the evolutionary programmings. Based on the extension of the GS, we have the differential evolution, we have the cultural algorithm. Based on the bird fucking behavior of fish schooling, uh, phenomena, we have the particle swarm optimization, right? We have uh, the behavior based on the behavior of the cat, we have the cat swarm optimization. Based on the flashing characteristic of the firefly, we have the firefly algorithm. And the, so many algorithms are there and so on, as I, I written here is so on, because uh, now if you see, uh, there are every day, you can say that there are new, new algorithms are coming, right? But basically uh, what I can, uh, say you that if you have understand the basic concept of the three algorithm, which is nothing but the genetic algorithm, particle swarm optimization, and uh, 
uh, your uh, uh, differential evolution three algorithms you have understand the perfectly definitely you can understand any of these algorithm because they are not far they are the combination of each others because the concept you can understand how this uh, optimization are going to take place so based on that i'll try to explain only one algorithm this uh, particle sum optimization uh, uh, which was uh, developed by kennedy as well as Eber Eber eberhardt in 1995 and he based on this just briefly i will explain because we don't i don't have the time uh, to give in detail and then i will come to the conclusion of this uh, how uh, these algorithms are utilized for the different case scenario of this time modulated concept so uh, the concept is nothing but the school uh, fish schooling behavior uh, they, this you can see that how they are uh, searching for the fish right so it was developed uh, by 1995 uh, by uh, the james kennedy and russell abel hart in 1995 so it is very simple uh, and very simple concept of the pso is nothing but here we require only two equation one is velocity equation and second one is the position equation so pso is a robust stochastic optimization and technique based on the movement and intelligence of the swarm searching for the most fert fertile feed location right so how this applies it is the concept of the social interaction to the problem solving because as i as i said that most of the case if you have understand the concept of genetic algorithm you have understand the concept of the particle swarm optimization and differential evolution other understanding of the other algorithm will become very simple right so here uh, uh, i'm just talking about the particle swarm optimization apply for the concept of the social interaction and only few parameters are required to adjust this which is nothing but the velocity expression as well as the <coughs> position expression so uh, this uh, there are some terminology like swarm is a collection of agents or particles the agent particles moves around the search space within the boundary the swarm is nothing but the one of the population in the population matrix so one of the population in the population matrix that is a collection of swarm in the population matrix the collection of swarm and each swarm is nothing but is a collection of agents or particles so those agents or particles are nothing but the the solution variables solution variables so you can say that suppose you have the 120 solution in one iteration and in in a in a in a, in a row wise 120 solution and the column wise you can see that number of variables what are the number of variables you are going to utilize for the optimization of your problem state right so in that case uh, the y x uh, these columns will be depending on this uh, the swarm so this swarm will be nothing but the collection of agents and particles so these agents or particles are nothing but your the solution variables solution variables so each particle agents are represented as a point in a d dimensional space this exchange flying position based on the personal flying experience and other flying experience and these are the values will be changing depending on this equation of the velocity as well as the position and will be upgrading the uh, velocity as well as the position and based on that uh, this uh, these agents will be uh, updating their personal behavior as well as the global behavior so there is another two terminology which is called as a p based as well as the g based so how do we do that uh, initially we will uh, randomly generate the population matrix so which is nothing but the collection of swarms represent the position of all the particles or agents in the d dimensional space then each swarm each swarm is nothing but the collection of agents keeps the record of its best position which are associated with the best solution right Uh, how we get the best solution depending on the cost value so cost value already we have discussed so the based on this uh, cost value we have seen that what are the uh, the uh, cost value expression the cost function expression and uh, in that cost function expression what are the variable parameters we are going to use so depending on the variable parameter you are the the column in the in the uh, swarm is going to change right 
that achieved so far that is it is related with the each row in a population matrix in a particular iteration and this based position is called as a p based so each agent will be keeping their own record up uh, and they will be updating in iteration by iteration right so let's say we have the randomly initialized radiation uh, uh, solution so from this solution we will be uh, getting the p based initially p based and uh, this is the uh, the each agent will be comparing with the previous iteration for that particular uh, uh, the uh, swarm value and they will be comparing uh, which either earlier one was the best or the uh, the current position current positions are the best so based on that they will be calculating the cost value and based on the cost calculation if it is a minimization problem if cost values uh, is the lower than the 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 best value which is giving uh, the lower cost value will be updated for the next iteration similarly we will have the each swarm the collection of agents or particle keeps the record of its base position which are associated with the base solution so based cost value again from the cost function which we have designed that has achieved so far in the group so in the group is nothing but in the iteration how many uh, how many uh, swarms are there suppose we have 100 swarms in one so i have shown you the picture of the different agents so different agents is carrying the different uh, uh, the collection of this particular swarm and from here we are achieving the for the group so in in number of solution in the number of solution uh, which particular solution is giving the best result for the minimization or maximizer maximizes so it is a related with the population matrix in a particular iteration and this based position of this partic uh, particles or swarms are called as a g based so we have the two things one is called as a p based as well as the g based so p based is related with the particular value or particular value in the particular iteration right now here it is it is talking g based is representing as a group information so we have in one iteration let's say we have 120 possible solution in 120 possible solution which solution is giving the best that will become the g based solution and this g based will be getting updated for the each and every iteration so once g based are getting updated once p based are getting updated obviously the convergence profile will be getting down if it is a minimization problem and this uh, uh, in each particle agent tries to moves toward the optimal solution based on its own experience which is nothing but p based and the best experience of the other group member which is nothing but g based so each agent tries to modify this position with the help of this particular equation which is called as a uh, velocity equation this is your velocity equation here and these are the initial values and uh, the p based are getting updated as well as the g based are, are getting updated and c1 and c1 c1 and c2 are some constant factor so generally we keep as a 1.5 to 2.5 uh, variation uh, and the random uh, is the random value uh, random 1 and random 2 will be the given as between the 0 to 1 normalized 0 to 1 so distance between the current position and p based so this is distance between the current position and p based and distance between the current position and the uh, g based so this is the current position and g base so the based on that we will be getting the uh, velocity and from this velocity expression will be will be uh, updating the position so this two equation only will be uh, will be utilized for the upgradation of this their position as well as the uh, velocities and these velocities and the position will be updated based on the p based and g based right so once we have done this uh, let's try to understand the uh, the some of the simulation results using the tmla using uh, using various algorithm however we have not discussed the all the algorithm we have just uh, talk about the particle sum optimization but uh, here i i would like to say the uh, the different case scenario the case 1 case 2 case 3 and case 4 so depending on this case scenario we can see that how the variation in the results we can have with the help of same optimization technique and uh, with the help of same cost function so optimal switching time sequence of the each element 
here we are only optimizing this time sequence and the second one is optimal switching time sequence of each element and optimal non uniform inter element spacing this is another case and the third case is optimal switching time sequence of each element optimal excitation phase of each element and optimal uniform inter element spacing so here three uh, optimizing parameter we are going to utilize here we are going to use two optimizing variable parameter and here we are going to use only one optimizing variable parameter and here we are using again two optimizing variable parameter but the inter element spacing is uniform here <coughs> here we have the non uniform inter element spacing so based on that we can see the uh, different case scenario so here there are various algorithm we have utilized that rga pso d algorithm npso so npso is nothing but the modified version of this uh, the pso algorithm then we have the d uh, dwm again it is a modified value of uh, uh, algorithm of this d algorithm then opposition harmonic search algorithm uh, these are the different algorithm we have used however we have not discussed this algorithm but we just discuss about the particle swarm optimus so we can see that uh, for the different case scenario we are going to get for the case one we are we are getting the slal of <coughs> maximum of then approximately 19 to 20 uh, db in case of second case case scenario where the optimizing variable parameters are different we are getting the better improvised version with re with respect to the uh, case one so here we can see that uh, even in case of pso we are getting better than this particular case however uh, the pso is not gi uh, not giving the best result because we have some of the advanced uh, as uh, are modified algorithms in this particular uh, study right now coming to the case 3 uh, again we we got that the better than the case 1 as well as the case 2 here also we can see that uh, the pso the performance of the pso is better than these uh, earlier two cases case 1 and case 2 and the fourth case is nothing but uh, again we can, we can say that this is the best result we have achieved for this particular study that case 1 case 2 case 3 and case 4 where we can see that pso is uh, still better than this particular case 1 case 2 and case 3 so depending on the uh, what is our uh, conclusion in that case that uh, even if you are talking about the cost function uh, we also need to look into the how uh, what are the uh, optimizing variable parameter we are going to choose so depending on the optimizing variable parameter we can do the pattern synthesis of the antenna array which is a time modulated antenna array so here uh, in this case we are optimal switching sequence is the additional control parameter you can say optimal switching sequence is the additional parameter for the controlling of the radiation pattern optimal radiation optimal switching for the third case and here also we can see this Uh, optimal switching sequence is an additional parameter and based on that we we could achieve this better result in this particular scenario and the flexibility will be more design complexity will be less flexibility will be more so this will be the uh, the case scenario so based on that uh, we can <coughs> so this is nothing but t test value p, uh, for the hypothetical test we use some t test value and p test value right now we can see the radiation pattern in this case uh, the radiation pattern for the different case scenario this is the the case 1 this is the case 2 and this is the case 3 and this is the case 4 so for the different case what we can we can see that uh, the npso has given the better result but here uh, the uh, this particular case is uh, is mentioned as a ors here but should be uh, the npso l wm so this is the case uh, case scenario for case 1 case 2 case 3 and case 4 and based on that we can apply the time modulation concept and uh, we can apply the uh, uh, the evolutionary optimization technique we can uh, do the pattern synthesis and based on that we can achieve the the desired radiation pattern so here what we are can can see the red color as well as the black color this is nothing but your first harmonic and the second harmonic can see that first harmonic and second harmonic so here the objective was designed to reduce the side lobe as well as the reduce the harmonic component but 
nowadays in the in the current research what we are doing in in case of wireless power transfer scenario we are utilizing the harmonic beams for the uh, for the powering the devices so these are the recent uh, development in the in this time or less some concept so in that uh, we have published two ieee paper current recently we have uh, published and uh, we have applied for the patent also one patent also we have applied based on the wireless power transfer concept so this is a novel concept if anybody of you are interested maybe this will be the uh, good area to do work on this particular time modulation concept so the current trend in this uh, time modulated concept is nothing but uh, the different geometries people are working right now in the current situation different geometries people are working and uh, they are working for this uh, uh, cognitive radio application they are working for the 5g communication or 6g communication because uh, they are utilizing the harmonic beam concept so these are the current topic of the research uh, in the current scenario the people are working on this time modulation concept even we are also working on this particular domain the harmonic beam steering as well as the, and latest uh, trend in this particular is the uh, wireless power transfer so one of my research scholar is already is going to complete his uh, thesis by this uh, april or may he has completely done on the wireless power transfer in the time modulated concept but here i have not discussed uh, about those wireless power transfer concept so uh, similarly we can, we can have the concentric array and circular antennas uh, so many things uh, we can have but depending on this uh, geometry we can have the concentric array so again i am not going to discuss these things because time is not there so if uh, here i would like to stop the uh, the things if you have anything uh, you can ask me so i am done with the presentation if you have uh, participant have any queries they can ask the questions yes sir okay thank you sir for your presentation uh, participants if you have any questions you can raise your hand we will unmute your space sir i have one question yes, sir so uh, you have uh, done the optimization techniques and uh, getting the results of using different optimization method so have you realized uh, physically after the optimization means you have you designed the physical things after optimization yeah we have done right now uh, uh, as i as i told that uh, this uh, one of my scholars are working on this uh, mm -hmm. the wireless power transfer so we have uh, designed uh, since we have the facility uh, in nit warangal recently mm -hmm. we have developed the nfi chamber the fabrication facilities are there mm -hmm. so we have uh, based on this optimization uh, we have implemented this and we have achieved this uh, whatever the optimization technique is given we have achieved and based on that we have uh, one ieee publication also okay okay that so based on your uh, experience which type of Mm, uh, technique is more accurate uh, with respect to the measured result as per your experience uh, based, basically we have uh, uh, see past particles on optimization techniques uh, uh, we have not claimed here because mm -hmm. this uh, here uh, we have used some of the uh, some of the advanced uh, optimization technique uh, because the we, we know that uh, these particles on optimization is are the just basic algorithm it has mm -hmm. become basic mm -hmm. algorithm for the comparison purpose so uh, based on the advanced uh, techniques we have used and uh, those techniques uh, we have implemented and we have got it okay okay so one of our uh, participants have questions uh, momita boss you can ask questions to sir you are you, are, you can unmute yourself uh, hello good evening sir good evening uh, Uh, sir as you mentioned that you are uh, working on wpt antennas so yeah. sir uh, can you suggest some techniques using which we can uh, enhance the gain of wpt antennas so uh, i would uh, suggest you to go uh, with some of our recent papers which have been recently published in time modulation wpt time modulated antennas 
so there we have discussed about the grain improvisation as well as the harmonic uh, how we are going to improvise the harmonic as well as the fundamental beam pattern because uh, they are uh, we are when we talk about the wireless power transfer we we have to uh, talk about two thing one is as a fundamental as well as the harmonic beam so uh, when when we are talk, talking about wipt means wireless information plus power transfer so information is related with your fundamental harmonic and the power is related with a, with your uh, year uh, with your harmonic pattern so we have to adjust balance in a such a way that we our information is also uh, transmitted as well as we are going to have the uh, power in the harmonic beam also because we cannot simply reduce the harmonic pattern otherwise we will not get the power at the receiver point so Sir, that we have yeah sir if we want to transmit only power hmm. then so in that case uh, uh, your fundamental uh, beam will not be uh, applicable then uh, there is no need of uh, wipt uh, yes sir so in that case how we can increase the gain of wpt because he, when we talk about the wipt uh, we have the information as well as the power so if you if you just want to have the wpt then there are some uh, other techniques are also available in the, the only for wpt not there are two things this wpt as well as wipt so for wpt there are different techniques are also available which is not which is not required to have the time modulation concept yes so some techniques can you uh, share with me yeah uh, there are some techniques but i uh, exactly don't remember right now there are some techniques okay thank you sir okay any other participants okay obhishek sir do you want to ask something I have one question. Uh, when we design the wireless power transfer for time modulation, which frequency we use generally? So basically, we have uh, tested it for uh, 2.4 gigahertz, uh, right? Because uh, uh, two things we have uh, tested. One is for 2.4 gigahertz as a fundamental frequency, and some uh, uh, kilohertz uh, for the uh, for the harmonic pattern. and uh, another antenna we have uh, designed and tested with the 5.8 gigahertz as a fundamental frequency as well as the some kilohertz for the uh, harmonic frequency because there should not be interference between the the fundamental and the frequency as i told you that uh, the fundamental frequencies are higher than the uh, time modulation frequency so those two things will come into the picture and uh, the the fundamental uh, concept of the time modulation is that your f not should be very very greater than f p thank you okay thank you uh, professor gopiram sir for your valuable time and the nice presentations regarding that uh, time modulated antenna arrays optimizations uh, we are uh, very much enhanced uh, with your uh, discussions regarding that how we can optimize the antenna array pattern and also the recent trends regarding the wireless power transmissions thank you sir uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentations thank you sir thank you so with this uh, we are concluding the our today's sessions uh, our tomorrow sessions will start from 2:30 pm and the meeting link will be same so we are going to meet on 2:30 pm thank you thank you participants